Good morning uh, and welcome uh, to the 29th uh, meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. <clears throat> I would ask everyone, as I usually do at this point, to switch off mobile phones as they can often interfere with the sound system, but also ask um, those who are with us this morning to take note that some of uh, the members are using tablet devices um, and this is instead of the hard copies of our papers. The first item uh, on the agenda today is our third evidence session on the Alcohol Licensing, Public Health and Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. Um, we have a round table with us this morning and we've got two round ta two, two evidence sessions so I, I, I'm suggesting in the interest of uh, you know, just getting to the evidence that we forgo the introductions round and uh, ask people to just introduce themselves when they, they participate and when they come in, if that's, if that's okay. Uh, and uh, I should also note at this time that we have uh, a, a, a apologies uh, from one of the witness panel, firstly, uh, Andy Tai, Policy Director, the Scottish Beer and Public Association, have been caught up in the, the fog and the traffic problems travelling from down south and uh, the plane cancelled last night, so our sympathies are with him and he's not with us this morning. Um, uh, the, my vice convener, Bob Doris, is, uh, for understandable reasons, not with us this morning, as, uh, as Dennis Robert, the Robertson, uh, who is not with us through illness. Game, uh, we're expecting Graeme Day, MSP, uh, as substitute uh, later um, uh, in, in the morning sessions to join us. So we pr proceed firstly, um, go straight to questions. Um, Rhoda Grant. I, w I would like to ask, um, what is the impact of advertising on consumption? It seems to me that when um, advertising regulation was previously tightened up so that it wasn't targeted at children, we now see a decrease in young people um, drinking, and I'm wondering if further tightening up um, could have the same impact. Yes, thank, thank you, convener. Um, it's absolutely right. I think we have been... Um, the, the children's drinking in, in Scotland has been going through a significant change over the past 10 years, um, and I think it's a very encouraging journey that we're on. Um, uh, obviously, I, I'm sort of... We, Portman Group regulates all other marketing except advertising, and Guy Parker from the SA represents the, um, the advertising sector. The idea is that it's completely sort of comprehensive and with no gaps regulatory framework that makes sure that the that alcohol marketing is responsible, not targeted at children, and is adult in its content and nature. Um, so very much, I think, there has been a very incredibly strong journey. I think the, the, the very benefit of a self-regulatory framework is, if you take the Portman Group Code, for example, we're, we're already in our fifth edition of that code. It was first introduced in 1996, and already it's gone through... Um, a number of changes, variations, improvements, and, and it can keep, keep flexing and adapting as new channels of marketing come in, as new approaches come in, as new styles and trends come in. I'd be very happy to provide further sort of detailed evidence on, on the changes that have happened in that sector. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, Jonathan Roberts from the Salvation Army. I think uh, while we agree that self-regulation is a positive thing, we, we think that the, um, the provisions of this bill would take it a step forward by... by Targeting, yes, advertising aimed at children, but um, we also see the value in uh, wider restrictions because the evidence shows that it's not just targeting that affects children's consumption, but a wider exposure to advertising in society generally. So whether it's targeted at children or not, it's the exposure that really has an impact on, on their intention to consume and on their level of consumption when they do begin taking up alcohol. So that, that would be our point of view and we have lots of evidence to point in that direction. Mr. Parker. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, we, we don't think that further restrictions on top of those that are already in place are necessary based on the evidence. Um, we regulate ads in all media, uh, including on posters. Um, we apply strict rules that put the protection of young people um, at the heart of our regulation through two routes. Uh, first of all, there are there are placement restrictions that prevent ads being targeted at minors um, and that also reduce the likelihood that they will see alcohol ads. They don't remove the likelihood that they will see alcohol ads. One can't do that without a complete ban, but they significantly reduce it. 
And the second route is we have content restrictions that ensure that ads don't appeal particularly to young people. So, for example, ads aren't allowed to reflect or be associated with youth culture. Uh, they mustn't link alcohol with daring, antisocial, aggressive or irresponsible behaviour. They mustn't link alcohol with seduction, sex or social success. Um, they mustn't show alcohol being handled or served irresponsibly. And they mustn't depict people um, drinking or playing a, a major part in the ad if those people either are or, or, or even just look under 25. Not under 18, but under 25. There's a kind of buffer built in. So these rules are, uh, are really pretty strict. They were strengthened significantly in 2005 in response to evidence that was presented by the then government as part of its alcohol harm reduction strategy. Um, in the last 10 years, as Sarah has explained, consumption, including underage drinking, including in Scotland, has been going in the right direction. It's been declining. Um, and the most the, the question from, um, from Rhoda Grant was about the evidence base. The, the most recent reviews of evidence um, are the 2009 Shah Review, which was commissioned by the then government. Um, it was a big review. It was independent. Um, there was also a 2009 review by the science group of the EU um, Alcohol and Health Forum that looked, about, looked at the evidence at a more wider European level. And last year, there was a global Cochrane review. And all of these reviews conclude that there's either a lack of evidence or only limited evidence of the impact of alcohol advertising on consumption. Um, and also a lack of evidence about the positive impact of advertising restrictions. By positive impact, I mean the, the ability for an ad restriction to deliver um, a, a reduction in um, drinking or harmful drinking. Um, limited evidence. The, the Shah Review talked about indicative evidence of a small but consistent um, um, impact of advertising on consumption by young people and on consumption at the population level, but talked about um, much stronger evidence uh, being there for relationships between things like price uh, and drinking. So the evidence is pretty li limited, and we've got to... We've got to regulate um, in accordance with the principles of good regulation, which require us to make sure that our regulation is targeted, uh, proportionate. And there are various other principles too, but when it comes to looking at the evidence base, the key ones are targeted regulation and proportionate regulation. Um, and in the context of uh, drinking patterns and, and welcome changes in drinking patterns, and given this evidence base that points only to a limited uh, impact of al alcohol, alcohol advertising on, on drinking, including young people's drinking. We think that the existing rules are set at the right level. Um, we apply them very strictly. Last month we banned an, an ad by Heineken for Strongbow. It's a YouTube ad. Uh, we banned it because we thought it implied that alcohol was as important or was more important than personal relationships. It was a, it was a very jokey ad, but that didn't get it off. Um, in July we banned an ad for the Diageo, a TV ad for the Diageo brand Smirnoff for implying that drinking Smirnoff was completely changing the, um, the nature of the social event and making it much more sort of joyous and fun. Um, just to put this into context in terms of the complaints that we receive, we get about 37,000 complaints a year relating to 17,000 adverts in total across all media, all products and sectors. Last year, 187 of them were about alcohol ads, and they related to about 140 ads. So that's a very, very small minority of the total. Actually, we think that, that, that our regulation of alcohol advertising is much more important and requires much more um, resource than is I I implied by that percentage of com complaints about alcohol ads. Um, but it goes to show, I think, that um, there isn't a lot of public concern in terms of the alcohol advertising that people are seeing. Um, the final point um, I'd like to make is that one of the things that came out of the Shah review was that there's disagreement in the academic research over whether bans reduce consumption or increase consumption by having the obviously unintended side effect of increasing price competition 
between competitors. Because the more you ban advertising, um, the less options they've got with what to do with their budget and money that was previously in their advertising budget, mostly doing brand advertising, competing with other competitors to increase brand share, mostly, not exclusively, but mostly. Money that was previously there moves, and they're much more likely to put it into lower prices or price promotions if they're allowed to do price promotions. And the evidence linking, as I said, the evidence linking price and consumption um, is a lot stronger than the evidence linking alcohol advertising and consumption. Mr. Critchlow. Hi, Nathan Critchlow. Um, I'm from the Institute of Social Marketing at the University of Stirling, working on a project funded by the Salvation Army. Um, just in relation to the Scottish context, I just want to raise awareness of a particular study conducted by the University of Stirling, which was published in 2011. It was a longitudinal study looking at exposure to alcohol marketing among young people in Scotland aged 12 to, 24, uh, aged 12 to 14 years, and they followed them up again two years later. At the first wave, they did find significant associations between increased awareness of and involvement with alcohol marketing, drinking behaviour and intentions to drink um, in the next year. And then at the follow-up stage, we found baseline exposure to alcohol marketing was significantly associated with drinking in those who weren't drinkers at baseline and increased consumption with those who were drinkers at baseline. And I think that's important just to highlight that given that the study was conducted in Scotland. Any, any of the other panellists that want to come in? Yes, please. Brian Cohen for Institute of Practitioners in Advertising. Um, I think, as well as the evidence, the point I'd like to make is I think is also, from an IPA point of view, what we'd ask is that people take into consideration not only the impact and effect of the legislation, in this case, in protecting harm to children, but also think about the wider advertising industry within Scotland. And I think that the impact on the industry could potentially be quite negative, I suppose. The point I wanted to make is I felt that the advertising industry within Scotland is very much here as a force for good and has a good track record in terms of producing campaigns which do social good. If you think of um, recently this weekend, we saw work which was done around the Detect Cancer Early programme to increase early detection of lung cancer, showing very positive results. I think also that from a um, advertising and, and advertising agencies make up an important part of the creative industries within Scotland, and so they're a driver of the, of the creative industries fueling things like uh, website development, um, app development, illustrators, filmmakers, photographers, all benefit from the advertising industry. And I think part of the benefit as well of advertising and the advertising industry is that it's part of the events ecosystem, which is a strong part of Scotland's economy. So events such as Tea in the Park, venues like SSE, uh, Hydro in Glasgow have all benefited from the expertise of IPA member agencies. And so I think in that sense, we just ask that when we're considering restrictions on any product or service there, also we also take into consideration the restrictions that those may have and a negative impact on the industry within Scotland and the positive effect it has on the economy. Yes, please. Uh, just to make a further thoughts? comment, Jonathan Roberts, a further comment on, um, on the research issues. Um, Nathan's clarified one particular research study there, but there have been several... Uh, reviews of the literature, several reviews of the research over the years showing um, that longitudinal studies, the majority of them do show that increased exposure to alcohol marketing uh, leads to increased consumption. And uh, the results of those surveys are accepted by um, researchers and health bodies. So the World Health Organization, for example, British Medical Association, they all accept that increased exposure, not just targeted marketing, but exposure of all kinds, um, it leads to increased consumption. And the Salvation Army supports many people with uh, alcohol misuse problems later in life, and most of them would date that back to their childhood experiences. And the habits and behaviours that are formed in childhood have affected them through their lives. And it's uh, the impact of exposure to marketing um, for under 18s that we're really concerned about, not just because of, of what happens at that age, but what happens as, uh, as life goes on for them. Okay. I've got a couple of members, but uh, you know, the, 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 I'm just trying to keep on the themes. Malcolm, uh, Richard, and then I'll, I see Mike as well, but uh, you, Malcolm. Follow and Guy, Guy Parker gave a very uh, a useful opening statement, but I think it would be helpful for us if we could have uh, 
a comparison of the measures in place for, uh, at present with the three specific proposals in the bill. I mean, it, it may be that uh, I think some of it has been covered in your written evidence, but I think it would be good to have on the record. This is what the bill is proposing. This is what you're saying is already in place. And I suppose the second question, although you dealt with enforcement in terms of the content of adverts, I wonder about enforcement in relation to the three areas that are actually covered by, um, well, you know what they are, the, the 200 metre one, the, the advertising one um, in shops and supermarkets and the sponsorship one. I think that would be useful just as a... Is on that round the table. Panelists? Yeah. Yeah. Very happy to um, kick off. Um, I just want to urge some caution around the um, restriction and the evidence, because I think, as Guy said, there is um, there's not clear evidence that marketing bans and restrictions actually drive reduced consumption. The biggest thing we've got is the Cochrane Review, and I would urge the committee to have a look at that. Um, that's the most comprehensive analysis of restrictions and marketing that we do have. So just to make that point... Um, in terms of the bill itself, I think there is much to welcome. Um, there is some, the, the importance of alcohol education for young people is, is fantastic. And I think actually widening that out to life skills and resilience training would be a great opportunity for the committee to recommend. Um, because I think sing, single issues obviously take a lot of time and you need different subjects in schools. But if you, if you build a whole programme about resilience and life skills education and training for children, then that, that can be just as effective, if not more so. Um, there are a number of... Um, we, Drinkware obviously provides some um, ready-built systems for that and called intuition that, that you may want to have a look at. Um, also um, very much uh, sort of welcome the alcohol awareness tr um, training and intervention as an alternative to, to penalty. I think um, we've seen that many much success comes when brief intervention and actually having that conversation about when alcohol is becoming a problem is a very effective way of, of sort of preempting bigger problems down the line. Um, Obviously, it's Section 9 that I'm sure, as you expect, that we, we think is may, um, may not be needed through legislation. There is already a very strong voluntary agreement that, that advertisers have given and brand producers not to feature alcohol advertising within 100 metres of schools. Um, I think this, is a, this has been a voluntary move, and I know that ma many of the major producers have, have rolled this out um, across the whole of the UK. Um, the, there are n numerous sort of poster sites, and I think one of the one of the big challenges and opportunities about a regulatory um, system will be trying to police that, trying to define what we mean by advertising, on promotioning, or marketing, and obviously then the potential impact on a small high street, for example, if you have um, you know three shops, a high street that's half a mile long, and a sort of couple of schools or a nursery and a crash, then effectively you've banned any sort of um, alcohol, uh, alcohol marketing or advertising along that whole high street. Um, I think there can be a big impact to local economies. I think the um, the importance of the the nighttime economy and a very responsible and enjoyable place that people want to go can be a huge driver of economic value for small town centres. So I would be very cautious about looking at, at restricting through legislation when actually what you can do is is come up with some very clever and innovative voluntary agreements to achieve the same end. Any other panellists but members want to come in there? Guy and Nathan, thanks. Um, thank you, convener. Um, two of the three advertising-specific measures that are proposed in the bill don't fall within our remit, so I can't really comment on them with any great degree of expertise. The two I'm talking about are the proposed restriction um, for, for ads so that they only appear in licensed areas of um, off sales um, premises and the, sponsors, the sponsorship restriction which Sarah will be very happy to talk to I'm, I'm sure because their code, the Portman Group's code covers sponsorship but we don't cover sponsorship arrangements. Um, the, the one that relates directly to the, the, the regulation that we deliver is the proposed uh, ban on alcohol advertising within 200 metres of schools, uh, nurseries, children's playgrounds and so on. Um, and, and, and I come back to the point I made in my opening remarks about making sure that there's the right correlation between what the evidence is telling us about the impact of alcohol advertising on people, including young people, and the level of regulation that we're delivering. And of course, of course it's a judgment call when you're making that, that judgment about exactly what the right 
what right standards should be, what the right right rules, what the right restrictions um, should be. Um, but in making that judgment, it's very important that we take into account the evidence base that that, that I've talked about. Um, yes, alcohol advertising has an impact on on consumption, including consumption by young people. Um, but the evidence is indicative, and it's uh, only a small impact, and it's significantly less, um, substantially less than the impact of other things uh, on young people. Other factors like parents, peers, price, availability, and, and so on. And there's a danger that we um, think we're going to get more than we're going to get if we bring in extra advertising restrictions. And the point I made earlier about us having to be evidence-based means that we can't just consider what the impact of our regulation is in terms of protecting people, particularly young people. We have also got to consider the um, impact of our regulation on the other side of the ledger, and that's the impact on people's right to see um, responsible advertising, adults' right to see responsible alcohol advertising, um, but, but also the impact on businesses, the impact on advertising-funded media, the impact on poster contractors who are funding bus stops and other street furniture that, 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 that communities welcome. Um, so we have to consider that too, otherwise our regulation gets pulled up at judicial review for not being in accordance with the principles of good regulation. Um, we don't think the evidence base is there to justify um, a 200 metre um, exclusion zone. Uh, I think in built up areas, particularly in Scotland, where I, I imagine there are, there, there are a lot of schools, nurseries and playgrounds, that's going to, I would have thought, rule out poster advertising um, to really quite a high degree. I don't have figures on the percentage of poster sites, um, but it's quite a significant restriction. Um, so that's our, that's our position on the, on the one out of the three of the advertising proposals in the bill that really um, I'm in a position to speak about. So it's not in principle, it's practicality and impact. I mean, you're the, is that not the I mean, we, Yeah, it's in, a in principle, we have the 100 metres ban. So the 100 metres ban is... This a, is an extension. Why, why yeah. wouldn't we extend that further if there's been some success for us? And the voluntary code suggests, or has claimed in some of the written evidence, they've contributed to the reduction in underage drinking and that trend being confirmed, etc. You know, I, I think it's a, it's a practicality case mm -hmm. in the sense, as I, Guy mentioned, that would potentially lead to a complete ban on outdoor advertising in certain locations. I'm not sure or we're not aware of anywhere what actually the register of schools, creches, nurseries and playgrounds ex exist. If that, if that does, then I'm not aware of it to be able to actually implement it based on that. Sorry. <laughs> it's a voluntary advertising. It's a it's a voluntary commitment yeah. because. <laughs> you know. yeah. I know you're desperate again, and you will be given Sorry. your opportunity again. Mm. But please don't. Can I respond to your question, convener? That that it's a it's a it's a judgment call, and it's about practicalities. It, it, it absolutely is that. Um, I mean, if you want to, if you want to. Um, uh, do everything you can, if your only consideration is to make sure that advertising is having absolutely no impact uh, on consumption, including consumption by young people, then you ban it all. That's the obvious thing to do. Um, my point is, you can't, if you're a responsible regulator, you can't only look at that side of the argument. You have to balance it up with the economic impact, for example, of banning advertising uh, and other things like unintended consequences. Um, uh, I talked about the economic impact on businesses that rely on um, advertising funding. We have to take that into account when we make our judgments about where we draw the line and what restrictions we put in place. I also talked about the fact that there might be this unintended consequence of because, because people are no longer allowed to spend their, um, their, their budgets or part of their budgets on alcohol advertising, they put it into reducing their price. And there's much stronger evidence linking well, prices. We are, we are, we are. Talking about this bill, it's not just talk, we're dealing with advertising this morning. Yeah. We've been dealing with the other issues, so we're not. It's not a standalone issue, as presented in the bill. There's a number of measures being proposed, as well as the government measures currently um, is stuck in the courts and the minimum pricing. And so there's a whole yeah. range of things, you know, issues at hand here. I'm going to get Nathan and Jonathan in, but I suppose 
in terms of the previous sessions, we need to deal with this issue about some of us being lay people. You know, the the issue of the current situation and promotions as against advertising, as against, you know, and whether this can be, the, the proposals can be considered as a, if you like, <coughs> creating a clarity and a tidying up of all of this so everybody's clear. But we maybe address that. But I'm going to get, obviously give Nathan uh, and, 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 and Jonathan Roberts an opportunity to come in here. Nathan. Can I just clarify with regards to the Cochrane review that's been cited um, with regards to restriction of advertising? It's my understanding that the Cochrane actually concluded there's a lack of robust evidence for or against the implementation of advertising restrictions, and they recommended that advertising restrictions should be implemented within a high-quality, well-monitored research program to ensure the evaluation over time and that all relevant outcomes in order to build the evidence base. just want to clarify that that was their conclusion. We, we you know, from academics, we always get a, 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 an argument for more, more research and uh, study. Um, uh, Mr. Roberts. Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment on self-regulation because it's generally accepted, well, it's accepted um, by a number of people that self-regulation doesn't work. You know, it's, it's good as far as it goes, but it's not as effective as um, statutory restrictions. And we've seen evidence of, um, I think there's a European Commission-sponsored report in 2012 that showed so many instances of the Portman codes being, uh, being got round by advertisers. Um, so that would be one point we'd make as far as self-regulation is concerned. Also, the sanctions we don't feel are very strong. And of course, once the advertising is out there, the job's been done. And any action that's taken is retrospective. The impact has already been made. So self-regulation, we feel, isn't as strong as, um, as making uh, statutory restrictions, which are included in this bill. But we, we, we feel that even these uh, measures in the bill, as good as they are, don't quite go far enough, because um, the 200-metre restriction, um, we wonder where that figure's come from, because has any evidence been given to show that you know, the number of, uh, or the amount of advertising that takes place within that that perimeter is is uh, more effective or more powerful than advertising beyond that perimeter. Um, there was a study in America showing that within 450 meters of a school of schools in Chicago, there were 900 instances of um, alcohol advertising. So, even within that much right, wider perimeter, there are there are strong um, messages being given across. Um, so, as far as the economic impact is concerned, we take that on board, and we would, you know, we would. Um, want to see that proper cost-benefit analyses were done if measures were taken. But there are plenty of other businesses who want to advertise, and I'm sure the economy wouldn't suffer totally through a lack of alcohol advertising. So that's just uh, some of the extra points we, we would make. Okay. Do, do you want to come back in it? Then, Malcolm? Oh, no, no. Sorry, I've got another, I've got another uh, party <laughs> member anyway, and I'll, I'll give them the right. Mr. Cohen. Yeah, I, I think... Um, Mr Chisholm's point about the, the practicality of it, I think one of the other practicalities that Guy talked on the areas that are covered, but I think around um, sponsorship as well, I think one of the things to consider is particularly how events which are, for example, cultural events which have multi-event, um, multi-audience events, where actually there may be children's events and adult events running at the same venues or in the same locations, and that the way that the Portman Code, I think, which I'm sure Sarah will be able to talk about in more detail, actually suggests it should be a 75% um, aggregate over 18, whereas I think the proposal in the bill is, is for a majority over 18. So in a sense, the Portman Code is stronger, but I also think it allows it to be an aggregate rather than individual events. So in that case where there is um, children's events and adult events, then they don't. Then a, a, an alcohol brand can still effectively sponsor that event because the majority of the aggregate will be over 18. I think um, I know the other evidence you've seen from Youth Link supported that. The sense that not restricting young people from taking part in events in national stadia or in major cultural spaces, which had some support from an alcohol brand as as part of uh, their commercial sponsorship of it. Okay. Sarah. Um, thanks, Brian. I'll just to, um, give a bit more detail about the sponsorship codes. I think it's, um, 
Uh, it's a great sort of um, example of leadership by, by Scotland, actually, that we have um, this UK-wide sponsorship code in the first place. It was actually developed, a set of comprehensive guidelines were developed in Scotland, working in partnership with the um, industry through the Scottish Government Alcohol Industry Partnership. Um, the Portman Group was able to take that, that great start, and then what we did is worked with all the rights holders major events and sports like Scottish rugby, Scottish golf, and we've actually developed a very comprehensive code of conduct and practice that actually helps to use the alcohol sponsorship um, for, the, for the Scottish good as well, insofar as it makes sure there's a binding commitment to promote both responsible drinking and other either diversionary or, or other activities that will help promote either sports or cultural events at grassroots level. Um, there are a number of very, very comprehensive and fairly sophisticated measures that are included in those guidelines as well. Um, Brian talked about sort of stadia. If you are sponsoring a major stadium that you uh, and that's going to run events for children, you have to cover up the hoardings and you make a commitment to do that. Um, there are some cl other, other areas that um, teams with under 18s in can't be sponsored. If, if you're a football team with a majority, a sort of 75% of under um, 18s or 25s, then you can't have alcohol sponsorship either. Um, if you've got an under-18 in your team, you can't use that person to promote the brand in any way. So, so there's a lot of very sophisticated and quite tight controls that exist. Um, but the other point to make there is actually sports sports sponsorship and cultural and events sponsorship is a huge part of sort of Scottish culture and, and well-being. And I think um, no, but many of us wouldn't argue that it's actually a great joy to actually go and see a sporting event or a cultural or arts festival and, and enjoy it enjoy a drink and um, what we're all aiming to do here and I think we're, we have the shared vision is that we want to normalize the responsible and moderate consumption of alcohol the, the danger of blanket bans and sort of brown papers and blacked out windows is that you start to create a whole sense of excitement around a product that is actually when used in moderation is a very a strong and enjoyable part of our cultural heritage so I would really sort of point those out, details out and um, we've got lots more detail on the sponsorship code and just to reiterate that it, it can be used to sort of promote responsible drinking and and to actually um one of the great examples was jensen button roaring around the streets of edinburgh last year i don't know if any of you saw that but it was a part of a, a part of a big brand sponsorship for johnny walker and what you have is these global sports icons um with blanket coverage telling kids not to drink and drive, it's not cool, don't do it. And I think a message like that resonates so strongly from, from people of that ilk than, than perhaps somebody in a, you know, sort of looking slightly more serious. So um, it, it can be used in a very powerful and meaningful way, provided it's strictly and tightly controlled. And I think the self-regulatory framework is, a, is an excellent way to do that without the cost to the Scottish taxpayer too. Richard Lyle. Thank you, Kandina. Um, Sarah Amrati and... Brian, Brian Cohen actually led into my question to, to Sarah, but um, I, I think I want to explore it and, and the point that Guy Parker made earlier. Um, in your submission, you put that Portman Group's code on alcohol sponsorship already goes further than the provisions contained in the bill to protect children from alcohol sponsorship. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to, to speak about that. But also you say um, in the bill... It cites that uh, there's a the situation of the, and I hope I pronounced this right, Louis Evan, um, uh, mark, uh, the ad French av alcohol advertising, marketing and sponsorship ban in France. And you cite that what's been said in the, in the explanation uh, uh, notes in the bill, if you look at what happened in France, it actually the entire opposite uh, became the case, where... Uh, the, the bill uh, in France, when introduced in 1991, failed to reduce underage drinking, uh, accompanied two decades of increased harmful consumption amongst French children. The uh, proportion of, of people who, who drunk actually went up or doubled uh, in, in the age range of 18 to 25, uh, 15 to 30. Uh, the uh, people increased from 28% to 25%. And basically, it failed. So, would you like to say a why the Portman Code is far better than the bill proposed, and b why do you think the French ban failed? Um, thank you, Mr. Lyle. And I'm, I'm with you. I'm not going to try and pronounce that particular bill, but the, the French alcohol marketing ban um, 
It, it, I'll start with that first. I think it's it's so often cited. Um, I think it's the loi van or something like that. Um, it's so often cited as as the great sort of you know the magic bullet that will will solve um, underage drinking and, and tackle and make it all go away. Um, I think the French government itself at some point has has said that it was introduced back in the 90s. Um, and what's happened in France is we've seen. Um, a, a very a complete opposite picture to what's happening here in Scotland. Their teen, rates of teenage drinking are, have actually been increasing through that period. Um, it's too complex a matter to, to give a direct causal link to there is no marketing and that's driving consumption, so I, I wouldn't go that far. But I, I think it does show that it, it, it's not an, a magic bullet that's going to suddenly change the direction of, of a cultural shift and um, we have got an incredible shift going on in terms of young people's drinking here in Scotland and I think it's building on that rather than coming up with it with a, a sort of a law that d didn't seem to achieve what it was aiming to achieve um, in that in terms of the Portman Group code I think I've um, I referenced at the beginning the, the code on naming and packaging is already in its fifth it's been updated and and changed five times in the last 20 years, I think it is. And, and the sponsorship code was introduced in 2014. Um, there are many things I've cited, things like um, images of under 25s just can't be used in sort of promotional marketing. And the idea of that is, although the legal age for drinking is 18, the risk is that that, that sort of blurry age between 18 and 24 that, that a 17-year-old or a 16-year-old might ad identify. So the industry, through its, through its self-regulatory code, and this isn't a voluntary code because you don't get to choose whether you apply to it. It applies to your drinks marketing whether you like it or not. Um, but the idea is to keep that real separation zone between <coughs> what is adult marketing and what just sort of might appeal to children. In the same way, there's, there's strong restrictions about not using sort of cartoon imagery or, or colours and fonts and brands that all appeal. All of this is really, really carefully looked at and set out in, within those codes. Um, and a great example is uh, something like um, I think uh, logos being used on children's replica kits, which actually didn't have to be legislated for, because after, I think you heard from a witness previously at a session who, who raised it as an issue, and what happened was through the voluntary action and discussing that with the Portman Group, we were able to bring in a restriction within the code that says absolutely no branding can be carried on children's replica kits. It already can't feature on any merchandising or anything, but it shouldn't be on children's replica kits either, so that they're just some of the examples of how far we can go uh, and it, it's a progressive and it, it's a, it can flex and be flexible as this, as circumstances change too uh, any any other no i need to see if there's any other responses to your original question richard i'm um, just on the 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 loi Evin, the french law um which is of, often um mentioned when people talk to us about why the restrictions we got in place in the UK don't mirror those restrictions in France. Just to build on a couple of points that Sarah made, um, the, the, there's been a steady decrease in the annual um, alcohol consumption of people in France um, over the last 40 or 50 years from a very high point. Um, there's been a steady decrease. That decrease started long before the adoption of the Loire Evin um, in 1991. Um, it even slowed down slightly. The decrease slowed down slightly after the ad adoption, although I'm, I'm, I very much doubt there's any causal relationship between those two things. Um, in 1999, um, an official French government evaluation report said that the law ha had been ineffective in reducing high-risk drinking patterns. Um, even the French anti-alcohol um, campaigning group um, accepted that the effects of the law were weak because drink, you know, problem drinking patterns were on the increase and have been on the increase in the last 20 years, particularly amongst young people. You know, their, their binge drinking problem is getting worse. Their harmful drinking problem amongst young people is getting worse, whereas in the UK, happily, our problem is getting less bad. Um, nonetheless, the the anti-alcohol NGO in France continues to advocate supporting the continuation of the ban on symbolic grounds. But the point I've been making is we can't make decisions as a regulator following the principles of good regulation on symbolic grounds. We've got to have good evidence that they're proportionate and targeted. Uh, you know, we're dealing with international brands. Is it, you know, you represent people right across Europe. As, as um, drinkers here, um, 
throughout that period uh, become more became more mature. That market became more restrictive. They sought new markets, and you know, we, you know, our own whisky brands market quite extensively young people across Europe. It's a younger people persons think in Europe rather than an older person think as it is here. So, you know, the, whether it be voluntary, whether it be legislation, there needs to be some discussion and uh, movement about this all of the time, or we do, we wouldn't we wouldn't have a you know. The, the industry itself would not have had a voluntary ban unless legislation was being discussed or legislation was being proposed. Or, you know, so I suppose in this, that context, if we're not having this, this, this debate about alcohol consumption <coughs> or whether we legislate for it or whatever, what, what would we be doing? People would just be getting on with it, would they not? They would be aggressively marketing their brand. That's what the responsibility is to do, is it not? I think to sell and grow the product. I think, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for, for alcohol companies, but when those alcohol companies um, talk to us in the context of the ASA regulatory system, um, they talk about the importance of making sure that their advertising is responsible. Um, because they don't want to be uh, implicated in, um, in in advertising that might have harmful effects, and of course they also want to. They've got a long term eye on their business, and mm -hmm. if they're irresponsible, then people might restrict their ability to to do business as well. Um, it isn't. It, it, I don't think it's. I don't think it's right to say that. In the absence of law, you're probably not saying this, but in the absence of law or some other form of imposed regulation, there would be a complete free-for-all. Uh, one of the driving forces behind advertising self-regulation in the, in the UK has been the recognition, and this does call upon business people to be far-sighted, and, and it, it's harder and harder for them to be far-sighted because of quarterly results and targets and expectations. It does call on them to be far-sighted. But there has long been in the UK a far-sighted recognition that if advertising is responsible and if the advertising industry funds an, an, an ASA system that makes sure their advertising is responsible and takes the day-to-day -day decisions out of their hands because they can't take decisions about their own um, ads and be credible... If they do that, then they will better maintain people's trust in advertising. And the reason why that works for them, they will tell you, is because if people are more likely rather than less likely to, to trust advertising and find it responsible, find it not misleading, not harmful, not offensive, then it works better for the companies. Well, just one comment on the French law, I suppose, is that, um, yes, that. The evidence is that uh, consumption has increased over the years while the law has been in place. But um, who's to say it might not have increased even more without the law? I mean, we don't have the research to show that. Plus the fact there are other forms of advertising which have come in over that period, like digital marketing, which have undermined, we would expect, the, um, the particular stipulations of, of that law over that period. But I think we, we always need to come back to the fact that Research shows over periods of time, the longitudinal research shows that exposure to marketing does increase consumption. And uh, whether it's targeted or not, it's exposure of all kinds. And on, on the sporting um, and cultural events advertising, um, the, the, the proposal for the bill uh, was surprised that it's um, not as stringent as the, the voluntary codes, actually. I think that's already been mentioned about the, the proportions of the intended audience. But um, the question we would have over that would be, well, how can you, uh, how can you uh, judge one proportion in one event against another proportion in another? So, for example, if you had um, an event with 50,000 people and you were looking at the majority of the intended audience as being young people, then you're looking at 25,000 if you had an event of 5,000, the intended audience of young people was, again, in the majority, you're looking at over 2,500. So you could have 
an instance where one event would you'd have to ban advertising because it was targeting the same number of people as a larger event which uh, had the same number of young people but was allowed to go ahead because of uh, the, you know, I'm not probably making that very clear but because of the proportions between events you might have 4,000 people attending one event 4,000 young people attending one event where advertising would be banned but 4,000 people attending another event where it wouldn't be banned so you'd have the same number of people the same impact but because the proportions uh, relate to different total figures you would have um, you know, a different approach to it so our concern with that is that uh, perhaps it needs tightening up and the processes around how proportions are applied need to be clarified but also we, we would recommend that the proportions are lowered so at least to the 25 percent that's part of the voluntary code but maybe even down as low as 10 percent which I think was rec recommended by um, uh, House of Commons committee in, in recent times um, or even which would be our recommendation a total ban of advertising at sporting and cultural events because as, as we said it's not just the targeted events but it's exposure uh, on a whole which uh, affects um, young people quick response to that to, 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 to those proposals very quick because we were in the last you know, section of this committee, and I've still got uh, committee members who wish to come in, and I've, I've got the member who's proposing the bill. So, quick responses to that. If I, I think I, well, I, a total ban on advertising, exporting, and cultural events, I, I don't think fits within the, the intention of the bill, which is prote protection of harm to children. I think when you look at some of those events, which alcohol brands support, um, things like the Ryder Cup, um, right through to the Mountain Rescue. Um, in Scotland, so actually funding that comes from alcohol brands to um, support organisations and support events in Scotland, I think, is a, is a good, positive way for brands to promote themselves and to promote themselves in a responsible way. I think as the IPA, we certainly in, endorse what Guy said, that our membership, our aim is for the membership to actually influence their clients, to influence the alcohol producers to market their brands responsibly because the best brands, the brands which are going to be most successful are those ones that behave in a responsible manner and we always place that influ influence on clients as much as possible. Um, just very briefly, I think um, I would urge comfort that Eve, um, I, I take your point about the sort of the ratios can, can change, but the absolute fundamental backstop is that advertising or, or any sort of in-brand in sponsorship must not be designed in a way that would particularly appeal to children. Um, so while it's an ad, it's adult in nature, the the 75-25 is it's pretty strong. I mean, it's stronger than the rest of the, the whole of Europe. I think they run something more like 70-30. Um, so we do go that further. But the the key point is that the the advertising must be to appeal to adults and not to children. Yep, briefly. Yep. In response to that particular point, um, the advertising at football clubs, for example, uh, and sponsorship of, of shirts. I mean, they might be aimed at adults, but they're bound to appeal to children. How can you not say that they'll appeal to children? It's self-evident, I would have thought. Because children, you know, football appeals to children, basically. So the sponsoring of events would have an impact on them as well. But it, it takes us back to the, you know, does, does exposure of a brand drive a children to take action? I mean, and, and you must be very clear that children are exposed to huge numbers of brands marketing and advertising across their daily lives um, there is a very clear filtering system that takes place and there's a lot of complexities around how marketing and advertising works but but the, the we must look at this in a positive way because what you can do is buy it's the same example as with the Jensen <coughs> button you know a, a childhood hero hearing a message about don't drink and drive from Jensen button is, is fundamentally a stronger and positive brand statement than than trying to get lots of lessons in school. I mean, this, this can work as part of a healthy and sensible culture. Um, and I think it's a real opportunity here for Scotland to, to look at those voluntary partnerships and frameworks and, and keep strengthening, keep making them fit for purpose as we go forward. Yes, Guy, briefly, and then I'll go to Mike McKenna. Just two very quick responses. Um, Mr Roberts is quite right that we, we, we don't know what would have happened if the Loi of uh, had not been uh, enacted. But I think I'm right in saying that in the presentation of this bill, the Loire van has been quoted as a, as a success in terms of um, its impact on um, uh, reducing consumption or harmful drinking. And I don't think that case has been made. And, and the point about digital advertising is a good one, because, of course, we all know that 
um, one of the things that's changed markedly about the world we live in is that in the last few years there's been this digital revolution um, and including the use of social media. Um, uh, and the point I want to make there is that the ASA system covers advertising in digital media. Um, there's quite a lot spoken about um, how advertisers, not just in the alcohol sector, but advertisers are uh, exploiting social media to um, irresponsibly advertise to children. We did a study um, a, a year or so ago that looked at the social media habits um, of under 18 year olds of the 427 ads that, that our, our, our children saw um, three of them were for alcohol and they were all on Facebook those ads and the, the children were served those ads because they they lied about their age and said they were over 18 which tells a, a different story about the arguable inadequacies of self-declared age verification as a, as a sort of age-gating system but I think does, does cause us to question what I think is a bit of a myth that children are being absolutely bombarded with advertising on social media. And if they were, and if this, if this was taking the place of advertising in other media, why, why are we happily seeing this decline in consumption, including amongst young people in this country? Mike McKenzie. Thank you, convener. Um... Part of what I wanted to ask has maybe already been covered, but I'd like to just get a wee bit more information, um, I suppose from Sarah and Guy, and it's about this French experience. Um, because the received wisdom in Scotland for many years has been that, along with our sick man of Europe status, we also have this very unhealthy relationship with alcohol. But from what I'm hearing this morning... Um, our experience, and I think Guy's just indicated the experience that, that, that the statistics show that actually compared to France at least, we're on the, a good trajectory, trajectory, whereas they're on a bad trajectory. What I'm wondering though is, where's the base level um, you know, of those trajectories? Are they, are they going to a bad place but are essentially overall in a much better place? And are we, um, you know, going to a good place, but our starting point is a much worse place? Um, I'm just interested to um, get that kind of context. Can, can help on that one? Um, can, can yep, Sarah. Um, I think, you know, you're absolutely um, right in a way. Um, Scotland had, a, in terms of, I mean, looking at statistics across the board, I mean, I think we all, everybody often cites UK statistics and that's fine, but looking at Scotland, you were starting from a much higher perspective, particularly in terms of young people's drinking. Um, and I think if you were looking back in 20, 2004, um, you know, of 13-year-olds, sort of two-thirds had, had tried alcohol at the age of 13 in 2004. Um, if you compare that now, in 2013, 68% of your 13-year-olds in Scotland have now not even tried alcohol. So that is a hugely positive generational shift. It's not to say that you weren't starting from a low level, but what, what we've seen, I mean, that, that's sort of gone down significantly. Um, one of the biggest measures I think that we all should focus on is past week drinking. People agree that's the sort of best way to look at what, what sort of you know what what habits are? Um, there is an incredible statistic that I pulled out from the the Scottish Adolescent Survey recently. Um, uh, um, in terms of the past week drinking, just one percent of your thirteen year olds have said they've tried alcohol in the last week, and that compares to ten percent back in two thousand and four. Um, so there is a huge generational change going on. Um, I would say on social media we. Again, we don't know why, but equally, if you compare the sort of a 10-year-old's, 13-year-old's leisure time now compared to 10 or 20 years ago, it looks fundamentally different. Um, I think we have to recognise that generationally, you know, alcohol is just not such a big thing anymore. I mean, it, it's still very important. It's still very harmful. And we know that there are, I mean, I think one of the, the, the biggest areas that we must look at is the variation in health harms as well. And that's both regionally and in terms of um, socio and economic class drinking as well. Some people are, are definitely suffering disproportionately more when they shouldn't be. And that, that's, the time, that's, the, that's the targeted tackling we should be looking at. Mr Robarts. On the statistics, we do acknowledge that uh, the consumption has fallen 
quite markedly in Scotland, but it's still at a very high level. So 32% of 13-year-olds would still say that they have drunk alcohol, and 70% of 15-year-olds would say so. So the levels are still very high, and compare that with 2% of 13-year-olds who say they've smoked, and, 15, and only 9% of 15-year-olds who say they've smoked, then the figures for alcohol are markedly higher than the figures for smoking, still at really an unacceptable level. And I make also the point that I made in conjunction with the French law that who's to say that those figures would not be lower if there had been greater marketing restrictions over that period. I mean, you can't argue one way or the other with those figures, but um, our basic point would be that they're still too high, and so I think that's a good uh, case for marketing restrictions being put in place. Nathan? Just to make a brief comment as well, I mean, we often default to France as the sort of default example of legislative processes with marketing but other European countries are moving forward with it as well and um, Finland and Norway in particular have quite high restrictions on the levels of marketing they have um, and a study published in 2006 showed that these countries as well have some of the lowest levels of consumption in Europe they were suggesting that there's an inverse relationship between the strength of policy and the amount of alcohol which has been consumed by young people so there's also a broader picture outside of just the French example okay just a quick supplementary convenient if that would be yeah, acceptable yeah. It's the one thing, given that mankind has never been able to resist the forbidden fruit since the dawn of mankind, I just wonder, thinking back to my own underage drinking experience, which seems a, a heartbeat ago, or, or ago um, the, the forbidden fruit sometimes does taste sweeter. And I just wonder, in terms of banning as opposed to perhaps advocating, using the powerful tool of advertising to advocate responsible drinking, you know, are we actually in danger of creating the problem that we're seeking to deal with if we go down the banning route with advertising? I think what we've heard this morning is proportionality. I'm trying to ask you a question here, but because there's no, you know, we are on a journey where we all agree around the table that, that um, there should be responsible marketing it's the extent of the advertising, is it not? Are the, are the, are the restrictions rather than the principle? What, what, what uh, convener, um, if, if you'll just um, indulge me for a second, is that um, Guy mentioned earlier on, earlier on they banned an, ad, a, an advert that said that the, the party would go better with Smirnoff. My life experience suggests that the party probably would go better with Maybe not Smirnoff, but certainly Ushkava, and that uh, perhaps life in general might go a wee bit better with a little bit, provided it's in moderation. And my understanding of young people is that they can abide hypocrisy even less than I can. So I just wonder, you did say that companies are keen to um, in ensure that people trust their advertising, but is there a, an opportunity for rather than having such a blunt instrument having an instrument that's maybe just a wee bit more precise, a bit more honest, and a bit more helpful. And I'd be keen to hear what the witnesses have to say Briefly, on this please. subject. Um, on, the, on, on the subject of that, that, that ruling, Heineken, Heineken would probably agree with you that we shouldn't have banned that, that sorry, Smirnoff, um, Diageo, that market Smirnoff would agree with you that we shouldn't have banned that ad. Um, but but the rules are strict, and we thought we should. I think there's a distinction between making sure that strict content rules are rigorously applied and um, banning advertising, which I think can send the message, the, the forbidden fruit message that you talk about. Although I, I worry more about the point I made earlier. I made a couple of times, actually, about budgets then moving into price, lower prices. Um, I, I'd sort of echo that, and I think I'm sure Brian would say as well. I think the the creative industries that we have, um, particularly around the you know, Scottish brands, are fantastic, and I think there is a real it gives a real rich tapestry to life to see these different stories being created around brands, and you know, and, and as consumers, we love that. You know, people don't want we, we've so passed a sort of you know, an age that people just want the facts that. Um, I think it would be very difficult in terms of the, the modern world to sort of look at that, um, even, even though I'm sure a fraction year ago. Um, but I would encourage, but, but that, that creativity must be constrained by 
a sensible, practical and proportionate framework. And, and I think that's sort of what we're trying to achieve with, the, with our self-regulatory frameworks. Mr Roberts, just, just a quick response to the point about the forbidden fruit. I think that applies more to the availability of uh, alcohol than to the advertising of alcohol, surely. Um, a restriction on advertising of alcohol doesn't make it less available. Uh, it just makes it more attractive. So I don't think the forbidden fruit argument really stands in that case. That's actually been, been answered, but could, could I just very briefly touch on the, the Norwegian situation where you mentioned uh, the, the <coughs> Salvation Army input, uh, the complete ban on advertising alcohol and the effect it has, has had on reducing consumption of alcohol. Do we actually know that? Or I mean, we all know that the price of alcohol in Norway is prohibitively expensive. Um, is, is that more of an impact than the ban on advertising? I mean, do we have any knowledge of? What's, what matters there? So maybe yeah. you could sub further information. Thanks. They had to took policy from multiple different components. I think guys mentioned it before. Marketing is just one subcomponent, and they were rating the overall strength of their policy, of which marketing was one. The particular study I refer to didn't isolate the independent effect of marketing with regards to the consumption. It was an overall sort of five-star policy review system, and looking at a correlation between that level of policy and the uh, level of alcohol consumption there. Uh, similar with France, I don't think I don't believe the Finnish or the Norwegian alcohol restrictions have been robustly evaluated, and I think that would tie in with what other witnesses have mentioned today, with regards to the evidence needing to be more robust before we can be fully um, sure of a ban being either for or against. And I think the Cochrane review reflected that as well. Thanks, Annette. Colin. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Um, my, I've just been sort of putting down some notes here. And are we not in danger here of um, trying to produce something without the thought that this is really, we're not as isolated, uh, shall we say, as perhaps in years gone by, we, um, we have in instant access to television screens for channels all over Europe. And just looking down at some of the major sports events we've had, Rugby World Cup heavily influenced by Heineken, Guinness Pro 12 Rugby League, the Ryder Cup with Johnny Walker, and even to product placement, uh, and just having just been to see the James Bond Spectre film of uh, Heineken being um, uh, prominent in one of the scenes there. Now, given that this is all available at this minute, how effective, considering the, the, the markets that Rugby World Cup, how do you actually say this, this so much of a percentage is aimed at adults and the rest is kids? This sort of thing. Are we not getting into a really technical area that really we have no control over? It's really just a case of it's there, it's international, it's available for all to be seen. And let's face it, the Rugby World Cup down in England and Wales has just been a spectacular success. And every time there's an interview, somebody's got a big sign Heineken at their back. So are, do we have to be a little bit more realistic here and actually sort of you know, I, I can see the point of maybe a hundred yards from a school and that sort of thing, but we have a, a cultural thing where alcohol is really quite predominant in our lives. And if we end up going down the road of over-regulation, do we end up just looking a touch hypocritical when it doesn't work? Mr Roberts, should we treat alcohol the same way as we treat tobacco? Yes, I think we should. And um, th the fact that we can see things through international sports events doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to cover areas that we're responsible for and, and reduce marketing uh, within our own jurisdiction. So, um, yeah, I acknowledge that there's, to, there is powerful marketing going on through international sports events, which we, we can't do much about. But um, um, I think that the, the, the advertising uh, and um, industry is quite powerful, and I think think was it the case that in Brazil in the World Cup that uh, the government was forced to change its policy because of, of FIFA wanting advertising to take place so you know even even when governments have regulations in place they can be overpowered by the strong lobbies against them so there, there are powerful forces out there and it, I would just say that shouldn't stop us trying to do within Scotland what we feel it's possible to do to take the steps that we can. I was, just, I, was, I was just giving them a, a second column, but I'll certainly let you go back in if anyone else wants to pick up on that. No? 
Guy? Just very quickly. Uh, we, we don't think that, that tobacco and alcohol are the same thing and should be treated in the same way when it comes to protections, societal protections. Um, and and the, I think the key difference between them is that y you can, and most people do, drink responsibly, um, but you can't smoke responsibly. Colin? Yeah, my final very short question really is, uh, given the list of events I've just read out there, the multi-million multi pound investments, obviously, in, from the drinks companies in major international events, has anyone had the actually looked at the effect that, um, say, a ban, an international ban on alcohol at these events, how much money would go missing from the sponsorship of sport? Sarah? Um, I, we don't collate sort of detailed, we don't have a big single figure as such. I know um, Ireland, I know, have been looking at the potential impact of what a ban on sports marketing would mean for sports and grassroots sports <coughs> going forward, and I think have, have delayed any decision on that as a result. Um, there, are, there are a couple of very interesting reports out there, um, one of which I think is, was done by Sports Scotland about the value of school, uh, sport to Scotland, um, uh, and I think there was talking about sort of two billions worth of value and fifty thousand pounds of jobs, and also obviously with the hospitality sector, um, there was an Oxford Economics report, I believe, around the the value of the hospitality sector to to Scotland and the GVA. Um, so they again may be worth looking at. Um, the beer sector, and it's a shame um, Mr. Ty is not here because I think he'd be able to give you more detail on that. Um, I'm sure he could follow up, but I think they looked at some of the sports sponsorships around beer brands, and that was some, um, I think there was a sort of 300 million, of which 50 um, million was being reinvested back into grassroots sports, so, so there is that investment back too. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have a really a single detailed figure, but in terms of value, there is some quite significant um, finance there. I think the point I add for the advertising agencies in Scotland benefit from having contracts with alcohol producers who work in that field and so that expertise enables us to help them help them and to compete globally so with events such as some of the events that you mentioned or with some of the brands which are working internationally they're able to draw on that expertise from agencies in Scotland so without that experience it'll make it more difficult for us to compete and reduce the ability of agencies to contribute to the creative sector in Scotland and I think it's worth remembering the creative industries is one of the most important sectors in Scotland and counts for I think 68,000 jobs and advertising is a real driver of that sector so it certainly helps generate um, a positive income for the economy in Scotland. Mr Roberts. If I remember right this question was raised at the previous session and it was Dr Rice I think who responded so I would refer you to his answer which I think was along the lines of um, there are plenty more companies out there, non-alcohol non companies, which are, are willing to sponsor. And, and um, uh, when you, I think you pointed to the English Premier League to say there's only one team that's being sponsored by an alcohol firm now, and that's from the Far East. So there are plenty of firms wanting and willing and with the capacity to sponsor. It doesn't rely, the industry doesn't, re the sport doesn't rely totally on the alcohol industry. And it, um, but I think he also said uh, that... Uh, he would agree that there would need to be some analysis done as to the impact, but he didn't feel it would be a totally negative impact. That's the question on that. I think and it that's was. Yeah. The reason I came up with the, yeah. um, the competitions, not necessarily the clubs. The mm -hmm. focus appears to have changed. Um, so anyway. Yeah. Yes. I think, I think there is support from an, an international level and right down to a small club level, and I, I think it is actually challenging to find sponsors to replace those sponsors I don't think it's as straightforward as saying there are lots of other companies who will take up that um, take up their place it's not necessarily the case and not particularly from agencies based in Scotland who are able to have a proximity to some of the alcohol brands who are based in Scotland to offer those services um, but it's not necessarily the case especially at a lower level and smaller events where community clubs benefit from the support of alcohol brands everything from Highland Games, I mentioned earlier, the Mountain Rescue. So there are a number of ways that alcohol sponsorship is supporting uh, local and international level. Um, sorry, it was very much Brian's point, really, that we, we do often, we focus often on the, the big sort of absolute blue ribboned events, but we must remember how much, how many layers of sponsorship right down to sort of local 
um, smaller teams and, and pub teams and, and, and less popular sports, which were, it's much more difficult to attract funding for as well. So um, that was very much Brian's point. Okay. Um, I think we're going to, well, just one area, I suppose, uh, that, you know, the, the, that we haven't covered, is, and we've got it in the next session, is the question of criminal, um, criminal sanctions that would, and sanctions in general, which would be um, uh, brought about by, by the bill. Um, and I, I think I'm going to set you up, Mr Robertson, and say that you, you believe that um, in terms of marketing and, and uh, that... Uh, You've suggested that ad additional sanctions would be necessary um, if the provisions of the bill were to be taken seriously and suggest that organisations breaching the rules should face a ban on future marketing activity for the appropriate time period. If you could speak to that, then we'll get a response from, from some of the panel members and then we'll quickly go to, to um, uh, Richard Simpson. Yes, I think our feeling was that this is such a serious matter that... Um, Stronger sanctions need to be in place to deter people from, uh, to deter the industry from, from uh, marketing uh, as they do currently. And so the £5,000 maximum fine, yes, and, and the fixed penalty notices um, are all well and good. good. Good steps, obviously, but we would see something more uh, effective in this 12-month um, kind of suspended sentence where if uh, a breach took place within that period, then there'd be a further 12-month ban on advertising so that's that would be the step that we we suggest a stronger sanction i mean we it goes back to the idea of self-regulation again where we don't think the sanctions are strong enough to deter people from marketing inappropriately and so with statutory regulation we would want the stronger sanctions to be there as a deterrent but there are written evidence anyway but we just we just want something on the record mr parker thank you that would be nice to hear um oh. I can't really comment on criminal sanctions. That's not really my area. I can talk to you about sanctions in the ASA system because that's what I know about. Um, I, think, I think compliance rates are really pretty high with the advertising codes that we police. Um, where companies are unable or unwilling to comply with the codes, then there are various sanctions that we can deploy to um, bring them into line. Um, in the alcohol area, um, there's almost no non-compliance. Um, there's almost no need for us to go to sanctions. And uh, the fact that companies really do not want an ASA ruling against them is a, an extremely powerful deterrent. And uh, I, I, know I, I know I can't invite you into an investigation because our investigations are obviously confidential, but I would love to be able to, to do that so you could see how, um, how very hard companies like Diageo and Heineken fight to try and persuade us that in their judgment, their ad is on the right side of the line. Now, these are companies that are also, with their long-sighted, long far-sighted hat on, supporting the ASA system. Uh, but when it comes to, 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 to battles about individual ads or ad campaigns, they will fight like tigers to avoid an ASA ban um, because the, the adverse publicity that that attracts is, is really very bad for them. Um, with smaller... So, you know, as a, as a hearing, a very serious step, is that sort of a, a nuclear... But if you were... We, uh, we breach, you were brought to a hearing. Or wh where does your work take place? Is it, is it confidential? Is it engagement with that company before it gets... It's only yeah, when yeah. you can't get movement. Yeah. So how, how, how would the committee evaluate what sort of work is being put in there and w the scale of the problem it wouldn't just necessarily be on the hearings, would it? I wouldn't you say, no. you know, saying that there was 10 hearings a year or 20 or 30 yeah. wouldn't give us any indication about the debate or the work that goes on to, 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 to confirm that regulation and get best practice, does it? You well, I, no, I think it, gives you an, I think it gives you an indication. The, the, the number, we, last year we published around eight or nine hundred rulings against companies. These are, these, these are the most formal, these are the conclusions of the most formal investigations we undertake. There's lots of other work we do as well that secures changes to ads and brings them into line that's dealt with in a different way. But the most formal investigations result in um, ASA rulings, which we publish weekly on our website. And there's around 900 of them. And if you look at the proportion of those that, are, uh, that relate to alcohol ads, it gives you an indication based on the number of complaints on, on how well the alcohol sector 
is complying with the codes. It's only an indication, but it gives you an indication. We also undertake surveys from time to time where we'll look at all the, all the alcohol ads in, uh, across various media for a month, normally the month leading up to Christmas, so normally December, and we will analyse them against the codes. We will work out which ones look to us to be prima facie in breach of the codes. We won't conduct five, six hundred investigations for obvious reasons, but we will get an indication of the compliance rate. And the compliance rates tend to be high. The area where we as a system are challenged when it comes to um, persuading companies who are un unwilling or un un unable to comply, normally unwilling, is much, much smaller companies um, online who are misleading people. And they very often don't have a reputation to care about. Um, they, just, they just want to fleece people for money, and they use advertising and marketing to do that. That's, that's, the, that's the area where in the last few years we have had to devote the most thought to our sanctions. And, and happily, due to a legal backstop arrangement with trading standards, we've now got a, 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 an increasingly successful legal backstop arrangement where trading standards is, is, is suspending the websites of these companies. So even there, where it is hardest for a, a self and co-regulatory system like the ASA, to, to make sure people stick to our rules. Even there, we're beginning to get some really good outcomes. Yeah, yeah. And, and for the Portman Group, I think the sanctions are, are pretty fierce as well. Um, not, uh, we have the support of all major retailers, so if, a, if the lay panel that makes the rulings finds that product in breach, um, it, a, a then an instruction goes out across all retail, the, the retail estate to remove that product until it's been changed or, or adjusted. Um, but but our, one of our biggest... Um, particularly around sponsorship and, and other things, is the cost of both repackaging and having to renegotiate a sponsorship deal are significant for a company. And the best anecdote I can get is one of the very senior directors who's in charge of this actually has a personal KPI that if he, ha if he breaches one of the industry codes, um, his bonus is shot for that year. So that's how important it is, right down to individuals um, have a responsibility to it as well. Thanks for that, Richard. Finally, yes. um, the current uh, regulatory framework in Scotland is that we have a 200 metre ban for promotions from premises and we have a voluntary ban in terms of 100 metres from schools and I want to ask the witnesses if there have been any problems with the current regulatory system and voluntary system. I mean it clearly is something that everybody's agreed should be there, it's in law in the case of the promotions. It's in the voluntary code in the terms of the Portman Agreement. They, they, they wouldn't have introduced it if they either hadn't been under pressure or had uh, felt that it was something that was reasonable. Um, so, you know, is there, are there any problems with that? Because my, my proposal is simply to bring the 200 metre uh, advertising ban into line with the 200 metre promotion ban, except in one case it's premises and in the other case it's schools. It's a very, very modest measure. It's not going to solve our drinking problem, but it is just to bring things into line. Uh, and just one other thing, just one correction. On okay, right, okay Can I think you've asked a couple of questions there. Are there any any problems with the existing regulations? Sarah? Um, I'm happy to go first. It is a voluntary code. I think um, I'm sure uh, Jonathan will tell me quite quickly there's a few that do come under the radar. Um, I think, as you can imagine, it's a fairly complex system with... Um, the number of poster sites every now and then and thanks to twitter actually can alert a brand quite quickly if a it's slipped through the net I and mean, they do their best with their media buyers to ensure that that rule is um upheld all the voluntary code is upheld together with the outdoor um outdoor advertising association who i know have changed their name so i do apologize Outsmart, perfect. Um, but, and the joy, the, because it is voluntary, if as soon as a company gets a, an alert, they can let their media buyer know very quickly and that poster can be removed. Everybody. Yeah, well, sorry to disappoint you, Sarah, but I can't actually point to any particular instances, but I know that there have been anecdotally instances of, of the 100 metre voluntary um, exclusion zone being breached but uh, on the general point of self-regulation I just come back again to to reports that have been issued for example the House of Commons Health Select Committee in 2010 um, looked at advertising practices um, within the industry and communications um, organizations and concluded that self-regulation does not work and that was a, that was their plain statement um, and again the European Commission report 2012 which I alluded to earlier 
said um, we find potential violations of the Portman Code in relation to the display of instances that may suggest any association with bravado or with violent, aggressive, dangerous or antisocial behaviour, suggest any association with sexual success or suggest that consumption of the drink can lead to social success or popularity. So they were able to identify a number of breaches of, of the codes and uh, concluded with the House of Commons Health Select Committee that self-regulation doesn't work. So th that's a general comment on self-regulation which would apply to the 100 metre exclusion zone and to the other aspects that we've been looking at, I think. Mr Park. Thank you, Convener. Um, we don't please either of the restrictions that Dr Simpson talked about, so I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to the question whether there have been any problems um, with them. Uh, on the point that um, that uh, Robert makes, Andrew Roberts makes, um, is it Andrew? Sorry, Jonathan Roberts, um, has made about self-regulation not working and that being the conclusion of the Health Select Committee inquiry in 2009, 2010. Um, I had, the, I had the, the pleasure of giving evidence to that Health Select Committee meeting. I'll tell you, it was a very different, it was a de very, it was very different experience to the experience that I'm having today giving evidence to you. Um, whilst giving evidence um, during the hour and a half or so when I was interrogated, I had no doubt that that was going to be the conclusion of that committee, even though it was some weeks and months before it published its conclusion. Um, I don't know why that was, but but it, it it seemed to me to be interested in only one side of the argument. I mean, I, I obviously don't agree that that the self that the advertising self regulation um, doesn't work. Uh, I think advertising self regulation does work. I think we've got we have a difficult job to do trying to strike this elusive balance between protecting people and allowing responsible advertising to thrive. It is a diff difficult balance um, to to to. To reach it calls for fine judgments, but generally I think we do it well. I'm no defender of self-regulation across the board. I think some self-regulation can be effective, some self-regulation is not effective. Um, I think it depends very much on the circumstances, but obviously I think advertising self-regulation in the UK is effective. Um, just to refer um, to the evidence which the University of Stirling published back in 2011, to sort of go through the various components of the bill. Um, with regards to posters and billboards, 53% of the 12 to 14 year olds were aware of alcohol marketing in that context, although I do know it's not possible to say whether that was within the restrictions outlined in the bill. 61% were aware of sports sponsorship, and with regards to the relatively untouched part of the bill today, that 55% of them were aware of in-store advertising for alcohol as well. So just to bring those to the attention. I'm going to pick up your other questions. Know if the advertising people have got any comments about problems they've had with this? No, I'm not aware of any no. problems we've had in terms of the restriction. I think the concern is that on outdoor, if I understand the um, legislation correctly, that extending it from 100 to 200 metres and also the scope to schools, nurseries, creches, and all playgrounds. That, as I mentioned earlier, I, we, I, I don't know if there is a analysis has been done of exactly what impact. <clears throat> that would have taking the geography of all those locations and looking at what that would mean in terms of where advertising would not be allowed. My um, judgment is that it would be a significant restriction and potentially lead to an uh, um, a, a effective ban on advertising in some urban areas. But as I say clearly, that would be a, a good bit of analysis to be able to do to actually accurately map all of the locations against where the ban would imp be imposed. There's no real problems with a 100 metre ban, you're just concerned that 200 is just a bit too much. But I mean, it would it be easier for, the, for everybody if we actually just went along the lines of the Salvation Army and many others out there on the side of concern about the alcohol problem feel that we should just have a total ban on billboard advertising. Would that be the simplest solution? Um, I don't think that would be a... So the simplest solution, or I don't think a solution, I think that what we'd advocate is where advertisers are advertising responsibly, then they should be able to do that. And I think the codes that we've talked about are in place to ensure that they do. Um. And the, the other question really is if people feel that, I mean, uh, the discussion about the Rye van was very interesting, uh, convener. Um, nobody is suggesting, and in fact, you know, WHO, WHO are very clear on this, that the main drivers of alcohol consumption are price and availability. We know that. But on the other hand, the industry doesn't spend literally billions of pounds on advertising if it doesn't have some effect. 
Um, so uh, the, the question is whether it is reasonable to control advertising in alcohol as opposed to other goods and services and have a more restrictive approach because if it is the case then we're really saying yes alcohol advertising is something that does have it does have an effect or is the argument being put forward that the um, the same as the tobacco industry it's not about consumption it's about the different brands which we know is a fallacious argument but is that the argument that's being put forward um, uh, thank you, convener. Uh, the, the the evidence the evidence shows that alcohol advertising has a small and consistent effect on consumption. Um, I think a lot of the money that that um, I don't have figures on this, but I'm sure a lot of the money that is in um, companies' advertising budgets is is there to try to um, get brand share of competitors rather than grow the market. But it's not exclusively for that. So, um, like you, I suspect. Um, I'm sorry to put words into your mind, but I, I, I am very suspicious of the argument that advertising only encourages brand switching. I don't think that's the case because sometimes there are new products that establish new cate categories and those, those categories grow. Um, uh, so the, the, the evidence um, says that. The question is, are the rules and restrictions already in place a proportionate response to that evidence? That's, to me, that's the big question. The, the, the ASA system um, and the Portman Group, but I'm, I'm obviously here to talk about the ASA system bit of it, um, already polices alcohol advertising substantially more strictly than the vast majority of other products and sectors. Um, there are advertising rules in the broadcast and non-broadcast codes that cover all advertising for all products and sectors, making sure that ads aren't misleading, harmful or offensive. In, both, in each of the broadcast and the non-broadcast codes, there are also quite detailed sections on alcohol that contain some of the rules that we've been talking about that um, further restrict alcohol advertising through placement and content rules. And, and the, the judgment that the ASA system has made over the years is that, that those restrictions are right given the potential harms that can result from people drinking irresponsibly. Yes, thank you, Convener. I'd, I'd just add to that, and I'm sure Brian and his teams know um, that the, if you're marketing alcohol, you're under much stricter rules and, and tougher codes than most other, you know, any other products really here in the UK. Um, I think we have to go back to first principles. Um, we are seeing a generational shift and a definite improvement that's going on, and I think we must build on that. Um, and that's not being achieved through restricting the marketing. It's about sort of it's about working together. And I think there's a real opportunity here um, to look at sort of local <coughs> partnerships as well. There's some great pilots that are beginning to go on around, particularly things like Best Bar None and pub watches and working with street pastors and and all of those other things. Because alcohol and marketing is just one small part of people's propensity and the way they drink. We know the peer influences are huge familial background, socio-economic, all those other factors are hugely important. And um, they, we can help to target down to those areas much more effectively while strengthening our pretty tough codes already. And that sort of partnership approach, I think we'll see another great shift down. Mr. Roberts. I'd agree, as you, you'd expect me to, with Guy, that um, advertising does affect consumption. And his question, I think, is right. The next question is, are we making a proportionate response to that? And I, I would suggest that uh, the current uh, voluntary codes don't do that, which is why we, we support the bill as far as it goes, but we want it to go further, of course. Um, and I think that, that the main point in saying that is that um, alcohol marketing, uh, and I think this is the aim of uh, Dr. Simpson's bill, is alcohol marketing normalises consumption amongst young people. And the aim of the bill is to denormalize that um, because it's that whole culture. It's not just the, um, not just peer pressure or the family environment, but the whole culture that's built around that, which enables peer pressure and the family environment to be effective, I think, which is something that needs to be tackled. And it's, uh, I think it's a proportionate response to say, let's put these restrictions in place to denormalize drinking amongst children and young people. And we're not... We're not trying to stop people drinking. You know, we're not trying to ban alcohol totally for everybody. Um, we're just trying to say that marketing has a powerful impact on people's drinking habits in childhood and beyond. 
leading to the kind of problems that we see in adults later in life. Can I just make one clarification? The, the UK codes that we police are not voluntary. I mean, you may have been talking about other, other voluntary arrangements like the 100 metre um, poster restriction, but the UK codes are not voluntary. You can't opt out of them. Yes, I think it just it's, it's almost a correction, and that is that uh, although it is true that the number of underage drink, uh, the, uh, the people drinking at 13 and 15 in the Salsa study uh, have reduced, and that's very welcome, and Sarah Hanratty quoted some, the very good figures that have occurred from that, but we don't know why. You know, maybe the education stuff I introduced as the minister when I was the justice minister had been a help, but who knows. But I, I should point out that along with almost every other northern European country, the ones who do drink are drinking more heavily. In other words, there's a bivalent approach occurring now, which is, is really makes life difficult. And the, the question really, I suppose, is whether if we denormalize for, or, and this is what the purpose of the bill is, we, if we denormalize for primary school children by having nothing within 200 meters of schools, they're less likely to be exposed less likely to be exposed to other advertising, not totally, but they will be less likely to be exposed to other advertising. And I wonder if, if the witnesses would agree that that, that, that that may be a measure which will give a, a small but maybe, maybe useful effect in terms of changing the perception of alcohol amongst the very young so that this group who heavily drink will actually be slightly less affected and will continue the downward trend that's already welcome. Mr. Parker, I, I don't, I don't yet understand how um, uh, a, a UK-wide advertising um, regime um, like the SA system that we that we are responsible for can be a part, a relatively small part, I, I would argue, of a context where alcohol consumption is decreasing, but but also uh, in part responsible for. Uh, a minority drinking more and I would have thought you need to look much more closely and carefully who those people are and where they're based because I, I think Sarah's right there's really very wide variation um, and there are some real problem areas around the whole of the UK and within Scotland I think you need to look at what's happening there and um, think very local in, in terms of in interventions to try and uh, change that picture just echo that as well. I mean, I, I think the alcohol education, together with the really tough clampdown on underage sales and, and preventing alcohol sales to children, it has been a huge success. Um, I think a shared vision, not just to, I mean, normalising alcohol, but normalising the responsible consumption of alcohol should be the shared vision. And I think we can all get behind that in a huge way. Um, I, I think the next big challenge is around proxy sales to, to underage, because... Uh, and this, I think the pilots going on in, um, and there's a couple of local Scottish pilots that are going on have been great success. And I would commend those to the committee that really targeted, this is like Google Earth stuff. We need to get right down and find out why that 10% and what's going on in their lives. And that's what we need to look at. Anyone else? Well, that concludes this evidence session. Thank you all very much for the time, your written evidence and your attendance here today. It's been very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. We suspend at this point until we set up for the next, the next panel and next session, which will...
Um, <clears throat> we now um, move to our second evidence session at today's meeting, uh, which of course is also on alcohol, alcohol licensing, public health and criminal justice Scotland bill. Uh, and this session will primarily focus on justice matters uh, which have been raised in the bill. Sorry, Annette, I didn't realise you weren't, but I was just waiting and then men coming back and forgot you. Sorry, I'll just give you a moment to. My apologies. Can I, I, can I welcome uh, our, our, our witnesses to this session? Tim Ross, Chief Inspector, Police Scotland. Uh, welcome. Robert uh, Sandiman, um, Director of Operations Development Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Welcome. And Bruce Millen, Criminal Justice Social Work uh, Development Social Work Scotland. Welcome to you all and thanks for your attendance this morning. And in the interest of time, we'll go directly to Richard Lyle for our first question. People who have to implement this bill or, or basically work with the bill or, or uh, have the effects of the bill. I would like to know their views in regards to the drink banning orders, adjustment to police process in uh, relation to fixed penalties, the clarity on, on the operation of the approved co uh, courses, and in particular to police, I would like to know your view on the proposal basically to, in some certain circumstances, to mark in, a, in an individual uh, shop, mark the, the, the items being sold so that it could trace back if there is underage drinking in the area? I think, I think, thank you, Richard, for that question. I think uh, uh, none of the other committee members have got a question now, but, I mean, uh, if you could uh, take some of that and, and, and allow, the, allow the other members to maybe develop and uh, ask supplementaries on some of the issues. Um, well, shall I start with the, so the last question about um, uh, bottle marking schemes. There have been examples of bottle marking schemes that have worked uh, throughout different areas of Scotland in the past, and this is quite an interesting proposal to see if you could formalise that uh, by application to the licensing board. I think our experience in the past is that bottle marking schemes have proved effective when they've been community-based schemes with involvement of the trade uh, and community in terms of trying to prevent drinking, which of course is uh, the, the, one of the aims of the bill. Um, I think since we first started doing bottle marking schemes, and I think the first one I was aware of could now be 10, 15 years ago, the kind of landscape around about licensing has changed quite a lot. Um, and in terms of what it would deliver for us, or for communities, um, in terms of preventing drinking, I'm not entirely clear on it now, in, in terms of we have different ways of enforcing things with test purchase, with Challenge 25, which perhaps have nullified slightly the benefits of some bottle marking scheme. Nevertheless, um, I, I still think that these schemes have their place, certainly on a voluntary basis, just in terms of reinforcing uh, retailer responsibility and getting that retailer buy-in, uh, and perhaps then providing, for, from a policeman enforcement perspective, uh, potentially providing better evidence to allow us to take further enforcement action in terms of some of the tactics I just mentioned. Um, so I don't know if that's been too helpful, but um, I, th I think these schemes are more effective, most effective, when you do get that real community and local buy-in involved in them. On that, that, that issue, we'll allow some, some of the uh, other members to maybe develop that because we did visit Newcastle recently. There's some good examples there. Um, o o on on the issue of of, of the the courts and the proposals for deferment and you know rather than fines etc. A penalty. Or, is it, have you given any of that thought? I think. Where um, we've really focused on is particular parts of the bill which require the courts uh, not to do something. Um, and where we're asking the court, where the bill is asking the court to explain its reasons when it's not imposing drinking banning orders. Um, and I think it's more in, in that respect that we have, um, we actually have a significant apprehension about those particular aspects. But in, in terms of the general operability, where it's uh, putting a, a, a drinking banning order in the positive. Um, based on the experience of England and Wales under the um, 2006 Act, the, there were relatively few of those actually imposed in England and Wales, adjusting for population size in Scotland. We're not talking large numbers necessarily in, in the positive. Um, so, the, you know, 
those are absorbable within existing businesses. I don't think we have a particular concern with those. Where we do have a concern, and I can talk about it in, in, in a bit more detail if you'd like me to, convener, is um, uh, both, uh, both, as I say, the negative obligation on, uh, on DBOs and also the GP notification uh, scheme, which is proposed in Section 31 uh, of the Bill. The issue for us is, is, is really a numbers one and time. We did put in a return to the, uh, the call for evidence talking about costings. But since then, we've been looking really at what, what would it actually mean in practice on a day-to-day -day court basis. Um, and to give you an idea of numbers, that we're estimating around um, 53,000 cases a year may be appropriate or be in the sort of frame of mind of the Crown and uh, judge um, as being appropriate for a drinking banning order, which is about half of half of all cases, on the basis that um, you know around about half of if around about half of cases have, have, have an alcohol element. If you translate that into time to explain uh, why the court is not granting one of these, and, and we're required to do that in section 22, 21, 7 and 8 of the bill, um, uh, where it says if the court uh, decides that the conditions in relevant to barring order are not met, um, it must give reasons for doing that in open court. Um, and then it goes on to say if it, it decides if the conditions are not met um, in relation to the offender at all, so that the conditions, you know, it was, it was up for consideration but decided on balance not to apply it at all, those also must be explained. If you allow for around about two minutes of consideration, which is a fair estimate, I'm probably taking much longer than that just explaining some of the background to this. Um, when you multiply that um, up by uh, 53,000, it, it works at around about um, uh, just two minutes. Uh, it translates into around about 350 additional court business days a year, just to explain why you're not not doing something. And, and so on that aspect, I think we have a, a, I think an apprehension would be as, probably as, as neutral as it can be about that particular part. But in the positive um I don't think we're talking about necessarily alarming numbers of these things, but maybe colleagues from police and social work may have a, a different view. And obviously there would be an experimental period as the provisions are tested and embedded in. Malcolm? Yeah, I, mean, I was interested in, in the evidence from the courts and tribunal service because it was covering areas that nobody else had covered in there. I mean, would it, would it be fair to say in summary that your main concerns about the bill um, are actually cost concerns rather than issues of of principle in the bill, although, I mean, the section on, I didn't totally understand it because I don't really know enough about court processes, but I take it the jurisdiction for applications to vary and revoke is not particularly a cost issue. You might want to explain that one, but are, would it be fair to say that the other ones are cost <coughs> implications and presumably you would be arguing for more staff or whatever in order to do all that? Uh, although I suppose the alternative in terms of your last point uh, would be uh, just to amend the bill so that you didn't, you know, you just have to explain what you didn't. And would, would that meet a lot of your concerns if you didn't have to explain why you didn't weren't issuing one? Certainly, on, on uh, as you say, I mean, the, the, in, in terms of broad principle, it's not uh, an issue that the courts service has a, a particular position on at all. I mean, that, I think that's a, a matter for for, for policy. Uh, but in terms of yes, as you say, the, the, in terms of actually making this practicable uh, and administering it, those the, the particularly section twenty two seven and eight, which I was referring to, they're not. The negative um, obligations are, are 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 very significant for the courts in practical terms if they were to go ahead. But the posit but you know, removing them wouldn't uh, um, affect the court's ability to pose them if they thought it was relevant to do so. Did I answer all the questions there? Well, I suppose, uh, as I said, I didn't quite understand. We would suggest that further consideration is given to the application process and in particular to ensuring that a sheriff in a second court is aware of the detail of the original application, but I just wasn't sure what the procedure was that was behind that statement, really. But I think a lot of those issues are probably issues that can be resolved in on implementation, mm -hmm. making sure that the relevant judge of the case transfers understands what's going on, so there's a proper background. But I think, I, I think those can probably be ironed out in... Uh, on implementation rather than issues of you know that need to be ironed out necessarily in the bill itself. Okay. Um, on a different subject, if that's okay. Um, I'm 
have read the evidence that you were giving about GP notification, and I think there were concerns about this, um, but more concerns about the practice rather than the purpose. And I think possibly most people would be signed up to the purpose in that intervention would happen, people would get the support they need, and <coughs> you know the, the, that offending would not reoccur. How in practice could this work? Um, I'm, I suppose I'm handing it back to you. If the policy is good, how could we make it work in practice? Again, on um, GP notifications, we were, um, you know, we get some, we get quite a lot of legislation from yourselves and uh, from the, the Parliament, and we often have to, you know, work out how we're actually going to do this, but make it, make it practicable. And I think one of the issues around the, the notifications one is is really just a practical one um, that. Um, how do you know, how does the court find out sensibly and, uh, and practically that um, a person is registered with a GP? Most people may be or, or, or maybe not. And we think that the best way to do it is to do it in open court if you don't have the background information in, in some report already which may not be forthcoming, which basically means so I would be up uh, and say, Mr Sanderman, you know, um, we're going to, uh, find you guilty of these offences, and we're going to um, impose um, uh, impose base orders. I'm also going to notify your GP about this. Can you let the clerk know, please, your uh, name and address, etc., etc., and, and then off you go. Now, just rehearsing that just now take, will probably take about up to about a minute of time, and again, multiplying that by fifty-three thousand, because that that's our number that we work with. That is a lot of time to add on to the, the court. There may be other ways around it, but essentially, I mean, the cost, there are some costs which we've mentioned in the return in the, in the, in the evidence about recorded delivery and making sure things are secure, uh, but they're not massive numbers. The, the bigger issue, I think, from looking at it again in preparation for this is, is a timing one. And, and again, proportionality has been mentioned, and I heard that in the earlier session about whether that is, this is whether that is the, the tool for the job and, and, and that obviously that's a decision for yourselves just going back to the, the drinking banning orders and the, and the initial question about enforcement them have you uh, as Mr Sanderman has said I don't anticipate that these would be massive numbers but we do uh, support the introduction of drinking banning orders uh, we see they could play a very useful role you know in the area that I work for example in North Ayrshire you might have relatively few people that we think the drinking banning order would apply to, but it would provide a really useful tool in terms of trying to prevent those who engage in repeat drinking, which then fuels alcohol, fuel disorder or criminal behaviour. Um, and in terms of enforcement, I don't think that would present us with a particular problem, resource-wise or what have you. We do try to proactively police those that cause us the most problems, uh, and these tools, are, I think, would be an additional welcome tool. Mr Milton, do you... I guess from a kind of social work point of view, most of our consideration is really around about the effectiveness. So again, in terms of the sort of drinking banning orders, we still have some reservations in terms of what, what does it really give us that, that isn't there already in terms of either the kind of anti-social behaviour legislation and or post conviction around about the community payback order legislation and again in, in terms of the the notification of GPs the, the kind of question that, that comes to mind is how effective will this be in engaging people in treatment so if if people are voluntarily notifying of their GP and then the GPs are informed yet there's no expectation or requirement on GPs to do anything with that information our, our question is, will it be effective, I guess, which is, I guess, up for up for grabs unless it was to be piloted in some way to see if, the, if it was actually going to be effective in engaging people in counselling or treatment or, or education. Would it? About the court time. Can I ask how much court time is used by repeat offenders? through alcohol misuse? Um, I, d I don't have those figures to hand. I mean, what, what I can say is we don't collect data as such on the number of uh, convictions relating to alcohol 
So we're, I'm not necessarily able to, to answer that, I'm afraid. But. OK, so no figures are, are currently collected about offences committed while under the influence of alcohol? Not as so far as I'm aware, no. OK, so we don't know the figures and we don't know the repeats? Mm. OK. So I've just brought it to you that it's only in recent years that, uh, as Police Scotland, we've started mandatorily that word, um, recording the involvement of alcohol. And I agree there's a degree of subjectivity around about that. Um, but in the past, it's not something we've been particularly good at, uh, necessarily having that statistic about the number of offences prompted by alcohol. But it is something we do now, uh, and those figures should start to become available. OK. Since when, when did you start collecting? Uh, I think it was a... I'd have to remember exactly. I think at least maybe 18 months ago to two years ago that we became in, in crime reports. Now, when we raise a crime report, there is actually a, a section for recording um, whether alcohol was a factor. OK. And would you be able, from that, to see what the degree of repeat offending was, the people that were continuously getting into trouble because of alcohol and <coughs> Yes, we would be. Um, it's quite easy to identify repeat offenders and repeat victims and what have you as well. So. Is it possible, maybe, for the committee to get that information? If it's, if it, I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot here, but if it's possible to get it, even a small amount of it would be really helpful. Yeah, I'll look into that and, and report back on that, if, if, that could be, if we could do that, yeah. Thank you. on by Mr Milne. It was to, to ask Mr Ross, do you think that uh, a drink banning order would be any more effective than the existing antisocial behaviour order in coping with this problem? I, I think it's an additional uh, tool that would be very specific for very specific circumstances. And as I commented, I don't see it being used uh, uh, a massive amount. But I think there are very specific cases where we do get people that um, engage in that kind of alcohol fuel behaviour that it would prove useful for, yes. You think it's necessary? Um, necessary, I suppose, to useful. I, I suppose yeah, you would have to look at the process in terms of antisocial behaviour officers and how uh, offers antisocial behaviour orders, um, and look at how effective they could be in that specific circumstance. Um, I, I suppose it's it's maybe more an alternative and a similar type of order uh, that might be useful for those particular kind of offending. Thank you. get to a situation where <coughs> people can start to identify that they may have a problem and seek help and whatever, you know, and, and we recently visited Newcastle and they, they claim to have a scheme in place which is no cost, which is, in their words, a no-brainer to introduce, which is uh, in relation to fixed penalty fines uh, for drink-related uh, incidents and criminality. And uh, you can defer uh, some of that, 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 that fine and go and participate in a four-hour um, course and things. Do you think there's some merit in these, the, the, these, these ideas to try and uh, change people's habits? They, they claim success for it. I don't know if you're aware of it, um, but they, they, they do claim uh, success for those type of initiatives in terms of reducing... Uh, uh, repeat offending. Uh, absolutely, I think it, there is merit in it. Um, we all know that intervention prevention is far more effective and cost cost effective uh, than trying to enforce things retrospectively. So, absolutely, if we could influence behaviour, um, then it would be very effective in terms of you know the delivery of alcohol. Brief interventions is one of the key things that many alcohol and drug partnerships and health services pursue because it's seen as being a, an effective way of trying to influence, influence people's behaviour. And I suppose this is perhaps a similar kind of thing if we could identify people that are involved in alcohol fueled offending uh, and having a, the awareness course as an alternative to fixed penalty, then it makes absolute sense. Um, particularly when we're looking at young people who perhaps sometimes aren't best placed to uh, pay fines and things then escalate and by non-payment of fine then become, they become more mesh in the criminal justice system, which with the best one in the world doesn't always provide the best outcomes for them. Um, so absolutely, I think that's a very positive option. I would agree in principle as well that it's a good idea. Again, the, the kind of questions that come to mind is particularly around about um, what form the alcohol education and prevention would take and how that would fit in with the, the kind of remit 
in terms of the community justice reforms around about community justice Scotland in developing practice and um, quality assurance in these areas and uh, um, would be hopeful to see that, that being joined up in some way so that we've got a consistent approach across across the, the kind of whole system. Any other members? Richard? Um, can I come to the Scots, Scottish Courts Tribunal Service? Date from which an order takes effect. We're talking about a drinking banning, banning order. In your submission, it's, it's quite confusing. Can you explain it? Basically, you're concerned about the fact that a time a banning order comes into place or, in fact, uh, it's specified when the court will make the decision or when the person is released. And it, uh, it's quite a confusing paragraph. Could you explain it? I mean, essentially, it's about, uh, again, my evidence days tends to be around about timing, and it's around about timing. When, when does the, the thing start? And, and um, particularly in release information, that's not something we... we we uh, will necessarily readily have to hand, but again, I think I think that one is another one which can be ironed out in the in, in on implementation that we can work out a practical way of resolving that. Do you have concerns about it? No, not not no. not particularly. I mean, these are some of the evidence here that we responded to is about um, is about um, uh, are offering the way of, of refining particular elements of the of the bill, and others are more substantive. But concerns. Can I put it, sorry, Kandina, can I do a scenario? Mm. OK, a uh, person's just been released. Uh, he had a drinking ban in order, but his time's not up yet. And he goes down to the pub and has a couple of jars. Or he or she goes down to the pub, sorry, and has a couple of jars. And the police lift him. And then someone comes back and says, oh, you had a drinking ban in order. No, no, I've, it, it finished at four o'clock. No, no, it's... It didn't finish at four o'clock. It actually should have been six o'clock. Do you see where I'm going with that? Yes, and I can see in that, and they've explained it to me, um, I can see that there, there may be practical issues there where, where timing, again, literally will be um, critical and that, um, uh, and that's something that I suppose police colleagues as well will, will need to, to, to think about how, we, how that would be practically approached. Would because you would need to know, obviously, that uh, the, the, all the justice. Well, that's the police. How they do. I, mean, I, I presume they, they know the time in the police Scotland. They, they, yeah, they, yeah. I mean, confusion does arise sometimes. There are a number of time limited measures that people have against them. Bail conditions, for example, um, you know, a number of things. And there is there are occasions when people get arrested who are quite adamant that that condition is no longer applicable to them. Uh, but the the criminal history system or whatever it says it is. Uh, and we have to have that discussion uh, around about when it is. But these are relatively few, um, and when they do arise, they can generally get sorted without too much uh, issue. It's, it's about putting the proper systems in place to try and make sure that people are aware of exactly what the restrictions are and what the timings of them are. Never in that position, yeah. and, uh, sorry, I have to just ask yeah. before I finish, is someone given a slip or a, a, or a paper that says your bail condition is... I, I used to be a justice of the peace... Uh, many years ago, but um, you know, as someone given a paper by the, the the courts to say, here's your condition and your your bail is up at X, Y, or Z. I'm just refreshing my memory of what the, the bill itself requires us to do, or requires the court to do. Um, I mean, I think from memory, it, it, you know, you have to explain at the time the nature and effect of the order, and obviously one of those things that will need to be absolutely nailed down, and that, that's where guidance and discussion with partners on, on implementation will say, well, where it's absolutely critical, it will expire at, you know, 12 o'clock on a Tuesday on blast, thereafter you can go back to the pub. Um, you know, and, but again, I mean, there's, there's probably sort of, there's more, um, there are issues there which are more, not so much legal, obviously, they are legal, but more about the sort of cultural changes that Dr uh, Simpson's talking about in his policy memorandum here, that when you come up to the end of these things, how do you, you know, what, what happens after that? Um, does, does life go back to normal or, or you know, or, or, or is that person monitored after that? And those are sort of issues I think are not so much for the courts really, but... Um, um, I think and offered as well, a thought. 
sorry, I think that's where it's important that we do have the approved courses as part of this measure as well, uh, because ultimately this must be about trying to influence future behaviour. Mm. Uh, and if the effect of the orders is only that we get to the end of them and then it's back to normal and back to the pub, then really there hasn't been a huge amount gained from them. So the approved courses are a very important part of this. Um, and they have to be something that would come in and make a difference. And that's really difficult to measure. You know, it's, uh, it's a long-term measure. Uh, and it's such a, you know, I listened with interest to some of the debate about advertising. It's such a complicated picture with so many influencing factors. Um, but I think that the approved courses is a, a vital part of this uh, in making it work. Thank you, Kadeen. Particular type of individual. I mean, I think you mentioned people who were particularly problematic, mm -hmm. violent or whatever. And it may you were supportive uh, uh, of of that type of action for particular yeah. groups and uh, are, are particular individuals mm -hmm. to uh, keep uh, them yeah. safe and the community safe. Uh, uh, Very much. Yeah, I mean, if there's any of the drinking ban, there are there is legislation, for example, to deal with people who are violent on premises uh, and you restrict their access to premises in the future. So this is perhaps at a slightly lower level than that. So what we would hope is that. Um, what percentage of that number is, I don't know. But even if I suppose you could say, well, you know what, in 20% of cases, we were able to influence future behaviour and reduce their drinking, which then has a knock-on benefit in terms of criminal behaviour, in terms of health, in terms of all the expenditure that we have, then that would probably be a success. And a reduction in court time and expense. Absolutely. Uh, Malcolm. Yeah, just a couple of more questions about the written evidence. I, I thought I'd exhausted the Scottish Courts and Trib Tribunal Service, but you, you referred in your last answer there, I think, to having to um, uh, um, explain the order, including the effect of the order and the consequences of not complying with it. And then you said that we would consider this to constitute legal advice. I was rather surprised by that. I mean, surely if you don't comply with it, is it not just a factual, there'll be a factual consequence, which is, you know, it, it's not really going to be legal advice, is it? It's just going to be stating the facts of the situation. I think that's a fair uh, comment, and I, th I think that there are ways to deliver this in a way that is more neutral. Um, uh, and I think we, we are getting more into, I suppose, the issues around about when you're asked to explain something, how far you go beyond just saying, well, this is what this means is X, Y, and Z, uh, where you go beyond that. And you do find that sometimes in court practice that you've, you've been asked to go a bit beyond that. that, that that is starting to stray more into the realms of advice. But, you know, within the sort of the middle bit that is possible to mm -hmm. do that. So, yes, I mean, and uh, just the, that. The police, just briefly, I, I welcome your strong messages on drink banning orders and approved courses, but you, the other subject you covered is fixed penalty, and you say... Police Scotland would require some adjustment to our current processes to facilitate fixed penalty. I mean, I thought I thought you already do fixed penalty, so I didn't totally understand that. We do, but at the moment, uh -huh. um, taking a course as a as a an option to paying is not uh, statutorily available to us. So we don't have processes for monitoring how that would work. For example, you know, when when the penalty is issued and it goes through our processes and then goes to the court for notification of payment, how exactly we would work around that administrative process of being notified that uh, the person had indeed taken up the course as an alternative to payment. It would just be a case of putting a process in place and there might be some cost involved in that. It's difficult to put a figure on that just now, but it would be there'd be some administrative implications for us. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. It was mentioned in the, the, the last um, session about, and I think we've recognised it in other sessions, about the, the proxy purchase and being, you know, the, the one of the ways that underage um, people can get access to alcohol and we've got the container marking proposals that you mentioned general support for. Um, do you think that and some, uh, you know, maybe give us some of your thoughts about other, you know, whether, whether there's other measures, but with that, the, the container marking, do you feel that that would uh, help to, to, to to tackle that, that issue of proxy purchase? It's a difficult one. Of course, the issue with proxy purchasing is that the sale of alcohol itself is not illegal. You know, it is selling alcohol to somebody who is of age. So whether bottle marking would have an effect on that, potentially not, um, because from a retailer's point of view, they wouldn't be doing anything wrong. Uh, if a bottles are marked or unmarked, it really doesn't make much difference as long as they're selling legally. It's then what happens to the alcohol thereafter. So I, I don't see... Uh, bottle marking have a huge effect on that. You're right, it is a big problem. 
Um, for as we know, uh, again, I think it was mentioned in the previous session about the influences in drinking and that kind of peer pressure and older people buying drink for younger people is, is a real issue and it's a difficult one to tackle uh, because you really have to see that transaction between the older person and the younger person uh, to take successful action about it. Um, so bottle marking would have a limited effect there, I think. Um, we I'm going to give you a couple of I mean, uh, this might relate to maybe your early experience in maybe in the community, but the police that we spoke to in Newcastle, and you referred to earlier about uh, in, uh, reinforcing the retail responsibility, they, they claimed certain instances where they could eliminate certain off-sales by using the marketing system. It's not a good target to target proxy sales because when they were finding young people, they, it wasn't the marked product that they had. So they were getting it from somewhere else. But also, they they believed help the police in their suspicion about poor retailers who are prepared to sell it and said, you know, oh, you know that uh, it helped discipline them. Uh, it helped to uh, support vulnerable staff members who come under peer pressure from younger people within a distinct community. And when they had the markings and when they had the posters and they had the campaign and the camera installed at things, that they, they took confidence from that and it was easier to deal with younger people who were putting a lot of pressure on them to sell, sell alcohol. They may have been younger themselves, and they felt it was easier just to sell them the alcohol and avoid any implicate. They lived in the neighbourhood or whatever, you know. So they they, they listed a number of, uh, of 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 positive outcomes uh, that that uh, in the Newcastle area, in the city, and the surrounding area that that uh, that, 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 that that this was that this was a helpful scheme for them. Yeah, and I think um, those are potentially the kind of benefits of the earlier schemes that I maybe referred to previously when they, you know, they do have most effect and you do get that trader buy-in and a real locality about it um, where we do identify premises sometimes that we, we suspect are maybe getting targeted by youths uh, for various reasons in terms of being easier to get alcohol from. Um, yes, potentially. Uh, they could be. Um, I, I'd like to think that in many instances we can do that voluntarily just now. The, would the, be good to have a legislative power, I suppose there may well be occasions when it might be helpful for us to go to a board to say, listen, can you please ensure that um, a bottle marking condition is imposed in this area because of a particular problem? Uh, but ab anything that we can support, responsible retailers is great. And those irresponsible ones, as I said, whilst the bottle marking in itself would rarely lead to enforcement action necessarily, what it does is provide good evidence that can allow us to take further, more targeted enforcement activity. For example, test purchase. Yes. Any other committee members? Richard, you've got lots of um, time. Can I first of all thank the um, witnesses today for the support in general on the principles and say that I understand the implications in terms of uh, being very careful not to overload time for police and, and courts in that respect. The, the information from Mr. Ross would be very useful to know how many cases there are. I mean, we know in terms of convictions, uh, out of the 45,000 admitted, you know, roughly 40% of an alcohol problem, higher in the youth offenders, of course, the 70%. Um, but I think the, the question I have is uh, to, to Mr. Milne, really, because you talked about treatment, and I'm actually not concerned about that. I think we've got that pretty well sorted. We've got the community payback orders, we've got the alcohol treatment requirement. Those things are in place for people who are dependent alcohol people. Really, the thrust of my bill is to pick up people much earlier. It's the, young, it's the ones who are starting off on those case, you know, where they're coming before the court with a, a relatively minor offence. Um, and the question is, at the moment, do the courts identify it? Well, we've heard, I think, and I asked Mr. Sandman to confirm this on the record, at the moment the courts don't uh, don't actually know if it's an alcohol offence unless it's clearly something quite serious. Uh, so the question is, do you think the measures in the bill will help in terms of the fine deferration, in, in terms of reduction on, D, on the few DPOs we do have? You can reduce it by going through an education course. Do you feel that, that dealing with people at that level 
is something that is going to be helpful because I know that the probation service or the Scottish Criminal Justice Service, as it's called nowadays, uh, actually deal tends to deal with a more serious group like DTTOs and things. Would obviously support people um, getting access to alcohol education or whatever services that they require at the, the earliest point. And again, I think in terms of the, the community justice reforms is looking to, to widen that kind of scope um, and not just being that kind of statutory um, criminal justice involvement that people have had in the past. I suppose one of the crucial things for me in relation to it would be um, how, how that assessment process would, would be undertaken. Um, so how how would we how would the assessment be that it was alcohol related offending and and what was the the cause behind the alcohol um, alcohol use and therefore what are we specifically targeting targeting in relation to our intervention is it is it purely educational or is or, or is there some other issues that we we want to be looking at to address during that process. So, for example, is somebody drinking because of bereavement? Do we want to get them to access um, services in relation to that? So, for me, I guess the devil would be in the detail about how it would be operating and how we would be assessing and, and also ensuring that we weren't including people who were alcohol dependent by mistake. Because I think one of the difficulties in relation to the use of the alcohol treatment requirement within the community payback order is is the the measures that need to be done in order to assess whether there's an alcohol dependency or not um, and i think that's one of the the biggest barriers to the use of the alcohol treatment requirement is getting that assessment done by a medical person within the time frame that we we tend to have to write a court report and therefore there's potentially a requirement that we have some sort of assessment undertaken um, to, to ensure that someone's not alcohol dependent and that we're not imposing a banning order on somebody that's alcohol dependent that could have associated health concerns. If, if, uh, do you think that if the, I mean, if the system is that the police are now recording if there's an alcohol involvement and that that doesn't at the moment have to automatically come to the court, but if it begins to come to the court, automatically and you see a couple of offenses like that but you know relatively minor things uh, that at that point that would be enough to say well at least they should go through an education program I mean the, people don't know that alcohol is a depressant and it causes you to have you know it can cause you to have problems that people don't really despite our school education system it's clear from the evidence that they don't know that so having that in place allows the police to say you know look this is this this person's had a couple of relatively minor offences. They've been fined a couple of times, or they've been, you know, they, they get into trouble in this particular pub on a regular basis. Let's have a banning order, but then they can ameliorate it. I would, I mean, I totally agree that I would support people being educated in the use of alcohol, and I would support that within our education system and within the the wider general population so absolutely if people are coming to the attention of the police in relation to um, offences that have occurred while someone's been under the influence of alcohol then absolutely i guess for me there's a bit about digging a bit deeper and looking at the, the role that alcohol is playing within the offending so while an a uh, I guess a standard alcohol education programme may impact on some people that are offending while under the influence of alcohol. It may not be, the, I guess, the magic bullet. It may, there, there may be something more that would that need to be addressed at the same time. Yes. Well, having, and Having been an addiction consultant, psychiatrist, I do appreciate that there are many, many different reasons for people getting into difficulty with alcohol. Uh, can, can I ask the, the uh, court service in terms of GP uh, two things? One is on GP notification, um, the, the bill suggests, I think, I hope, that uh, it would only be if the, if the person actually gave, gave you the GP. I mean, it, you, you don't have to do anything to try and find that out. You don't have to go to the, to the um, Scottish services to find out if the, who their GP is. It would only be the voluntary. Because, again, we're dealing with the lower level of people. So provided they volunteer it, uh, then GP notification wouldn't 
perhaps be a particular difficulty. You already notify others, presumably, of the result of the offence. Uh, the, 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 the court's decision is notified generally or publicised in some way. So it, be, it would be a, a small additional measure. I think, I mean, uh, I suppose the issue is really how do you make it effective? Um, and if, if it is, I don't know it's appropriate to ask questions here, but um, you know, if you're thinking about a voluntary scheme and you're saying as part of your you know, the criminal disposal here, would you, you know, and put it in some form or, or, or in citation or whatever, or collect it some administratively, um, that that um, will also, um, you know, if if you give us the, your GP's details, we will also get in touch with them as part of that, part of the overall criminal process. Now, um, you know, psychology is obviously here department um, um, but if if that's really to work how do you put more of a force onto that than just saying well if you if you want to you can tell us and if it is voluntary um, and this is not wearing a court service hat this is wearing a just a, a civil service hat here if if you're um, um, if it is voluntary and the spirit of the disclosure is voluntary would they do it anyway with the GP now you may say they, they wouldn't but um, and if it's to be something a bit more than that, how do we just how do we eat that information out? Our thought was that we would, you know, you could do it in court, and that would um, that would um, you know the, the sort of authority and the, the theatre of the occasion would, would get more disclosure there. But if it's to be something softer than that, obviously we can look at that and do more modelling if you find that helpful. But um, um, those were our thoughts. That's very helpful. I mean, we'll have a, have, have a think about that. I mean, the, the, the idea is to get people to say yes to yeah. if they start to admit, you know, mm -hmm. that, okay, I did this, but actually I was drinking at the time, and this is, this is maybe the second time it's happened. You know, nothing happens to them at that point except they get a fine or they get, you know, there's no action. Whereas, and certainly my experience when I was a minister getting the drug courts going and the, the ATT years going, the consequences for individuals began, you know, they began, began the court was taking a proactive involvement, which they never did before. And I think mm -hmm. certainly talking to various members of the judiciary, they found that extremely useful. So, I, I, but I accept your point that we need to be careful that we don't make an imposition onto the court that's too significant. Yeah, and if I may, I'm just thinking about even there, if, if we're thinking about something more proactive, and it were to prompt a conversation in court, and I'm, all, I'm only here thinking about numbers and time, if that prompts a conversation in court of some kind, some yeah. kind of voluntary disclosure by the person, if you multiply that by the numbers we're, we're talking about here, um, which you know a very high number of cases where you at least got to consider the issue, um, that adds quite, that, you know, a minute to two minutes times, you know, 50,000 adds a lot onto court time and, and pushes everything else out. So it's whether there's another way of doing it, or, or there's a different, you know, whether the policy aspiration is it can be achieved in a, in a different way. Um, okay, I mean, hopefully it would lead to a reduction of a few percentage points in the number of cases, which is going to save a lot more time, but because mm -hmm. you wouldn't have a whole case. On the question of the uh, the, the DBOs, uh, the intention was that it would only be if the if the police or prosecutors actually did raise the question of alcohol. If alcohol wasn't there, the courts wouldn't be required to actually ask the individual if they have an alcohol problem. So it would only be the ones where it was notified. Um, and it, the question is, you know, how often is that the case if it's not something that's really serious? If the alcohol is not an, a central part of the problem, but but a peripheral part or a, you know, a minor part of it, but nevertheless something that was causing them to have more trouble, how often does that go to the court as a notification? And I would have thought, not, not a great deal, but I don't know. It really depends on the nature of the report submitted to, to the Procurator Fiscal. Uh, and I think what you might find is that quite often alcohol is mentioned, but it might be in the general body of a report and what yes. have you. So what we might have to look at is how effectively do we notify the Fiscal yes. uh, that alcohol is actually a factor here? So do we make that as a, that as a discussion that would have to be had? Do we have an, a, you know, a separate paragraph or a separate tick box, for want of a better word, of how we actually notify the Fiscal that um, alcohol is an issue? You know, it's similar to what we do just now in terms of we try to identify cases where early and effective intervention 
um, or do, so diversion from prosecution might be suitable uh, for the accused person because we all appreciate that's a, generally a, a better option for us than going into criminal justice systems. You know, so we do have paragraphs at the end of police reports that this may be uh, suitable for some kind of diversion from prosecution, and I see this as being similar uh, yes. and a different option, yes. uh, which would be very useful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. If there's no other questions for committee members, uh, it just leaves me to thank uh, our witnesses this morning. Thank you very much indeed for your time and uh, repeated time. Mr Ross, another guys today, it's nice to see you back. <laughs> uh, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. And I think we're now going into a private session as we have previously agreed.